welcome to the Che Institute Scientific Innovation Series. I'm Sang Shim, Professor of Chemistry at Korea University. Today we take a look at a remarkable innovation that shifted our view of physics, chemistry and biology. It weaves together seemingly disparate elements of single molecule, light and life. What led to this groundbreaking achievement and what does it mean for the future of science and technology? To answer this, we have invited three exceptional scholars. Our first speaker is Professor William Warner. He's the Professor of Chemistry and Applied Physics at Stanford University. He is the recipient of 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the development of super-resolution fluorescence microscopy. Uh, as an undergraduate, he studied physics, electrical engineering, mathematics at Washington University, and he received his PhD in physics from Cornell University. Today, he's going to talk about single molecules and light, opening a window into the biological nanoscale. I'm going to talk about single molecules and light and how this opens a window into the biological nanoscale. So in order to do this, I have to give you some background and tell you a little bit about what I mean. And uh, as a roadmap for what I'm going to describe, I'll talk a little bit about the early history of single molecules, to just to give you an idea of where they came from, and then talk about something called super resolution imaging with single molecules. I'll give you a few examples about how this uh, looks very deeply and precisely on a very small scale uh, down to uh, uh, in, in, uh, into behavior and shapes uh, in cells in three dimensions and even looking at the glycocalyx. Then we jump into coronavirus RNA as an example of what can be done with this technique uh, in terms of learning about how a biological system works that has obviously biomedical implications as well. Uh, I'll end with talking about connecting electron tomography with single molecules. So that's the plan. Uh, and let's get started with this great drawing, uh, artistic drawing by, by David Goodsell of a bacterium. We are all really interested in this grand challenge of observing the nanoscale molecular machinery within living cells or complex systems and trying to understand the, what goes on there. But when you look at the, uh, this object, a, a bacterium, which is just a few microns in size and blow it up, now you see on a finer scale, uh, there are many, many components inside the cell, RNA, DNA, proteins, ribosomes, and so on. Uh, and they're all crammed in, in particular, in these, bio, in these bacterial cells. So in order to see this, you would like to have an imaging that can be very sensitive, but also very specific so that you know what you're looking at. You'd like to be able to image living cells, but you can also learn a lot from fixed cells. And you want high spatial resolution because, as you can see, everything is very small in this picture. Well, uh, we're going to use light for this, but there's a problem. Uh, the smallest possible visible laser spot, if I focus it down to the smallest spot that I can in, in the red or in the visible, is too large compared to all these very tiny objects inside. So the, that's the first problem. And that actually has been addressed by this uh, new technique called super resolution microscopy. We're going to circumvent the diffraction limit. And let me ex explain how this works. Here's a bacterial cell where some particular proteins have been labeled fluorescently inside. And you might think all you have to do is to just buy a very expensive microscope, and then you'll be able to see the details. But here's what happens. E even with a conventional, very expensive microscopes, uh, and you blow up that picture, you don't see anything uh, in, of detail. It's all very fuzzy. And that's because even though the labels, the fluorescent labels attached to specific proteins are just a few nanometers in size, they appear to be a few hundred nanometers in size due to optical diffraction, an idea from Ernst Abbe back in the late 1800s. So that's the problem of uh, diffraction limited imaging, but super resolution imaging produces from this cell, this kind of an image with far more detail. 
And it's uh, many, many times beyond this diffraction limit, down to some tens of nanometers. So I'm going to explain how that works. First of all, we need to go back a little bit into history, because I want to mention that uh, in my laboratory, Lothar Kotor and I first detected a single molecule uh, in 1989 at liquid helium temperatures, quite a physics-y type of experiment. It utilized high-resolution laser frequency modulation spectroscopy, kind of like your FM radio. And this happened at IBM Research. So why, why did this happen? Well, it turned out we were exploring optical data storage back in those days. And from the fundamental studies that we were doing, I became uh, inspired to push to detect a single molecule as it was done in 1989. In 1990, Michel Aurie also detected the absorption from single molecule by detecting fluorescence. Now, there were many surprises during those early years at low temperature. One of them is blinking. The, the individual molecules at low temperatures would turn on and off, even though they're frozen in liquid helium, or they can be switched on and off with light. You see, when you go to the single molecule regime, you're, you're, you're not doing a normal experiment that, that requires millions and billions of molecules. Here you see one at a time and anything that might change that molecule can be visible. Well, quickly, the field moved to room temperature in the, in the 1990s, mid 1990s, and many methods were shown to allow you to see single molecules at room temperature without cooling to low temperatures. And there was an explosion of room temperature studies. For example, single molecule FRET, as you will hear about in a little while from uh, Professor Ha, uh, that was done back in the 1990s, a lifetime measurements, polarization measurements, many other biological studies. But there were also some important surprises from low temperature. We observed in 1997 that a single green fluorescent protein a widely used biological label would also blink and switch at room temperature. So let me show you how that works. This is the surprise. Uh, and so think of th this picture on the left, which are, uh, is a collection of bacterial cells viewed with white light. These are colobacter crescentis cells. Uh, there is a fluorescent protein, enhanced yellow fluorescent protein in particular, that's been fused to a specific bacterial protein in these cells. On the right is the fluorescence image of this same field. And you see these spots. So these spots are the images of single molecules. And the uh, important thing is that in this particular situation, we could take a movie of the light coming from these molecules. And I wanna show you what that movie looks like, slowed down three times. Uh, and let me just emphasize that the molecules here are not moving. But the movie shows this fantastic blinking of the individual green fluorescent proteins. All these spots are, are inside these cells. And when we saw this, we were excited because it was a new scientific uh, discovery and the exact mechanism was not known right at the beginning. Various people made fun of us and they said, oh, well, this is not gonna be very useful because the molecules are too unstable. But of course, when you uh, discover something like this, it's it, really wonderful in science that you can actually later perhaps think of something useful to do with it. So that's uh, what I need to explain this super resolution microscopy that I mentioned. So, so here's the general idea of how it works. First, we localize those single molecules with high precision. Now, what do I mean by that? Those spots had a diameter in that last little movie, uh, which is roughly that width that I talked about from diffraction, a few hundred nanometers. Well, since you can measure this on a camera with many pixels, you have measurements of the shape of this spot, so you can fit the measurements to a model function and extract a parameter, which is the position of the molecule. Uh, which can be known to high precision, much better than the 250 nanometer width. The precision scales as one over the square root of the number of molecule, number of uh, photons detected uh, in this single molecule image and can be down into the tens of nanometers or lower. But this by itself is not resolution. It's not really distinguishing two objects that are close together because if they're close together, they will, these, uh, these images, or we call them point spread functions, will overlap and you can't do this fitting. So the next idea, an important idea, is to have some kind of an on-off mechanism. 
some way to have the molecules be on part of the time or and off part of the time so that you see them sometimes and sometimes you don't. This is uh, uh, can be achieved by blinking or by photochemistry. Uh, and, and so uh, you can use whatever technique uh, the experimenter wants to use to actively control the molecules so that only a few are on at any one time. That's the crucial idea there. So here's an example. Suppose this is what the sample looks like. Uh, it, concentric rings, and these rings have been labeled with, with many fluorescent dyes all along them. So if you just have all of them emitting at, at the same time, then you just see the blurry image. But if you have this active control mechanism, then you can set it up so that only a few are on in one frame of the camera. This is one frame of the camera. Then you uh, go to the next frame of the camera, and if it's a random process, other molecules will turn on. So you can have uh, use the blinking or photo control to make sure that the molecules are separated. Then you do this this fitting process and localize where they are and, and then uh, list all of the positions in the computer and then show them all at once, which will show the detailed uh, resolution far beyond the diffraction limit. So that's how this works. And it allows uh, light to be used to go below this 250 nanometer limit inside cells. So let's do that, uh, that idea. Let's illustrate that directly with imaging of a cell. Uh, here on the left is uh, an, a mammalian cell where tubulin has been labeled with a dye, uh, Lexaflora 647, which is one of these dyes that will blink on and off uh, in, in a technique that's called storm. But there's another technique called palm. And those are just examples of this smackum idea that I've already described. In one frame of the movie, you see many singles, so you can localize them and put little spots on the right at every one of the positions of these single molecules. The next frame of the movie, as I said, they are blinking here, so other molecules are on, and the next frame, more molecules are on, uh, more molecules, more positions. And so if you take a movie of many of, of these uh, pictures, then uh, from that entire movie, you can reconstruct this very high resolution image far beyond the diffraction limit down onto the order of a 10 nanometer resolution now. You can see there's far more detail and far more information. And it's a general idea in biology that if you can see more, you can learn more. So there's just many, many examples uh, of that sort in the literature. And I'm only going to take time to mention a few very briefly. In the axons of our cells, that are neuronal cells, the axons are the long structures that reach out very far to the next uh, neuronal cell. Uh, the, the Zhuang lab uh, discovered by this method that there are interesting patterns of organization of the proteins in the axon. These lines that are perpendicular to the long axis of the axon were not known uh, before super-resolution microscopy. Here's detail inside a nucleus uh, of the synaptonemal complex. Here are tiny little uh, aggregates and fibrils of Huntington protein and a mutant cell that is a model for Huntington's disease. So this relates to uh, amyloid types of diseases. And here's the glycocalyx on a cell surface they, uh, that are, that's decorating the tubules that are sticking around on the outside of this cell. We'll talk about this a little more in a moment. So uh, the basic idea is that many scientists all over the world have been using these techniques and, and others that are related, like stimulated emission depletion microscopy from Stefan Hell or uh, structured illumination from Gustafson uh, to observe beyond the diffraction limit. Uh, now, uh, it's also important that three-dimensional imaging can be done uh, with this technique. This involves some additional optics that I'm not going to describe right now, but if you change the microscope slightly to give you not only X and Y information, but also Z, then you can record three-dimensional images with super resolution. Here are, here's the structure of a cell membrane uh, where the cell has been placed on top of nanopillars, and we can see the cell membrane growing around the nanopillars. Here is the nuclear lamina uh, inside a cell. This is a sort of sac that sits around the outside uh, of the nucleus just inside the nuclear membrane. 
And here's that glycocalyx again, but now I'm showing it in 3D. Many cells have tubules that extend to the outside, and you can use three-dimensional imaging where the color is the Z, Z dimension in these pictures. Let's, let's now uh, switch a little bit to talk a little bit more about a specific example uh, that, that where I can talk a little bit more about the, the biological detail. So the glycocalyx is what I'd like to describe a moment uh, of what you see if you do super mic microscopy of this structure. This was a collaboration with uh, Dr. Dorigo at Stanford and, and Dr. Bertozzi at Stanford. You may have heard her name. She's a, a recent Nobel laureate. Electron microscopy shows that many cells have this hairy-like structure on the outside, but it's composed of glycoproteins, proteoglycans, glycolipids, basically a lot of sugars, a lot of glycans that are on the outside of mammalian cells. Uh, it is known to be relevant, but its more precise architecture and organization is not fully known. Now, there have been many drawings and cartoons like this that have been drawn because it's it's been known that certain sequences of glycans or sugars are attached on the surface of either proteins or lipids on the outsides of these cells. Uh, in the work I'm going to describe, I'm going to be only interested in the Galnac uh, um, uh, sugar or, or glycan and the sialic acid glycan, which is at the very tip at the end. So sialic acid is at the tip and the, the other uh, glycan is uh, distal from the tip. It turns out that there's a nice way to label sialic acid. There's the structure of this sugar uh, using periodate and aniline so that you can add a fluorophore attached to a fluorescent molecule attached to the sialic acids, the, the purple diamonds. Galnac can be labeled using uh, metabolic labeling, the, the idea that uh, Bertozzi has, has pioneered, where you create special sugars that have an azide on them, this N3 structure, and then feed that to the cell so that the cell will then produce these particular molecules with uh, the azide molecule attached. Then you can use a fluor, fluorophore with an alkyne functionality so that it will react with the azide and covalently attach fluorophores at those specific positions on the outside. You can also provide lipids to the cell that have an azide, and then the same chemistry can be used to label the lipid. So, uh, my students and uh, postdoc, Leonhard, Kavon, and Anish uh, did a super resolution imaging of these structures. Look on the right first over here. These are the diffraction limited images where you can see that there are some tubules. But with super resolution, I hope you can see that you get far more detail. In fact, you can see both sides of these tubules uh, uh, that are decorating the surface of this particular cell, which is a cancer related cell. Uh, and this is being produced exactly by the method that I showed, a movie that re records the blinking of single molecules to show the position of, in this case, the sialic acids. Well, that's very exciting, but what can we learn from it? Well, it turned out that what we can do, since we can measure uh, the, the, the gap and, and the width of the tubule very precisely as reported by the fluorescent labels, then we can learn where those particular glycans are located within the glycocalyx on the outside of these tubules. Uh, and so we can also look at the distances between lipid uh, lipids on both sides, as well as what's out in the glycocalyx. So uh, we, could, we did this for several of these interesting glycans, and you can see the uh, kind of important results here uh, this is patient 215. The, these are cells that have come uh, directly from, uh, from patients, uh, pro cells that have been grown in culture in the Dorigo lab. You can see that the tubule measured width is smaller than that from the other two uh, glycans, and that the sialic acid is at the outer part. Uh, and that's true for several different patients. But more importantly, uh, these measurements of glycocalyx height uh, can uh, respond to different cancer signals, such as activation of RAS. The glycocalyx was shown to grow in our work, which we know also proceeds with tumor progression. And in this work, we were able to identify, to identify a particular gene, Gaolin T7, uh, which was directly involved uh, in this expression uh, and an increase in the glycocalyx site. 
a knockdown of gal and T7 reduce the glycocalyx height. So what I'm what I'm just showing you here really is an example of when you have these measurements that have this precise, very finely detailed image, you can learn more about the cellular biology. Let's switch now to another exciting system, because uh, I can't uh, I, I I can't keep myself uh, from talking about this exciting system. Uh, the our imaging studies that have been going on recently of, of coronaviruses and how they infect cells. Uh, I just want to mention collaborators here. Are my students, uh, Jure and Anish uh, and Lanhard Mukherl again, uh, were involved in all of these measurements as well as collaborators from the group of Professor Stanley Chi, uh, also at Stanford. Uh, and so uh, they're more biochemical experts and we are the imaging people. So combining the two together, uh, is is a wonderful in this case. So as a little introduction, uh, I know that many of you are aware that a, a coronavirus is something like a small parasite. And the, the coronavirus itself, the virion, is roughly 100 nanometers in size. It's composed uh, of a cell membrane, uh, a, a membrane actually, but not really a cell in the usual sense, with spike proteins on the outside and with uh, something very important on the inside shown here in orange, that is the genome, the, the genome of the virus, the RNA, single-stranded, positive sense, genomic RNA for the coronavirus. It is, it is decorated with a nucleocapsid protein that uh, winds around that, gene, that DNA, uh, sorry, that RNA uh, inside the virus particle. Now, Let's jump into a little bit more of the known biology. How does the infection get started? So a number of people over the years have been exploring how coronaviruses attack cells. And I'm sure some of you may have heard that these viruses attach to receptors on the cell surface of, of our cells, the mammalian cells, and get inside. But let's look at the first few things that happen. First of all, when that positive sense RNA is released, it turns out that uh, positive sense RNA is very much like messenger RNA. And so it's ready for translation by the ribosomes. It's so-called ribosome ready. So the host ribosomes just start making proteins uh, when they see uh, this piece of positive sense gRNA. Uh, these proteins are often connected together, but a viral proteinase is produced quickly, which cuts up these little pieces, and they start getting used in, in different parts of the cell cycle of the virus. But the, the important one I want to mention right off the bat here is that a, a number of these small proteins, these non-structural proteins, form a complex called RDRP. Now, RDRP is a very important player uh, in the uh, in the viral life cycle. So let's talk about RDRP now. It turns out that the RDRP uh, is just an acronym for RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's an enzyme that's going to copy the RNA. And so the first thing it does is to take this uh, positive sense genomic RNA, that, that one copy that came into the cell through the virus particle, and make a copy of it which is going to be negative sense RNA, single-stranded uh, RNA, which is uh, synthesized by the action of this enzyme. Well, you can see what will happen next. Then the enzyme can, can do the opposite. It can take the, the negative strand and use it as a template for making another positive strand. And so this goes on back and forth fairly quickly to make um, many copies of more genomic RNA, the positive sense genomic RNA, which is used to produce more proteins inside the cell for sure, and also will be packed into new variants. But there's also this negative sense RNA that's present, and the plus and minus strands can hybridize to, perform, to form double-stranded RNA, or dsRNA, which is also has to be present inside the cell as something like an intermediate, but it would be closely associated with the replication sites. So there's, there's a great deal uh, to, to say about the whole life cycle, but we're only going to focus on the replication part, uh, only the beginning, not the production of the downstream virus, new virus particles. We just want to know where genomic RNA and double-stranded RNA are stored. <laughs> that's, a, that's what we're after. Okay, so uh, 
for fluorescent labeling, we need to label the structures of interest. And first of all, the virus that I'm going to talk about right now is, is the human coronavirus 229E. Now, this one is a much safer but relatively close relative of SARS-CoV-2, the, the, the really pathogenic one that is responsible uh, for, for the pandemic. So this is the one that we could uh, study more easily at, at the beginning, actually, uh, of the pandemic uh, without having to use uh, BSL-3 uh, laboratories. Uh, it basically produces a common cold if you happen to get this one. Uh, the cells are going to be MRC5 human lung fibroglasts. And how are we going to light up the objects of interest? First of all, the genomic RNA. We're going to use fish probes, fluorescence in situ hybridization probes that are, those are short segments of uh, single stranded RNA that have been uh, labeled with a fluorescent dye that will be one of these blinking dyes necessary for super resolution microscopy. Uh, the double-stranded RNA, we can label with an antibody, which is available, that's specific to double-stranded RNA, and it has a, also a blinking floor on it. We can label the endoplasmic reticulum in these cells using a genetic label to, to a protein, SEC61 beta, which is in the ER of the cell, and it also is fluorescently labeled with a blinking floor using GFP and a nanobody. Spike is an antibody labeled object that we can also look at. And there are more, uh, but I'm not going to talk about uh, others right now, uh, just for, for reasons of time. So now imagine that you want to look inside a, a single mammalian cell and see what you see if you want to look for the gRNA. So first of all, uh, let's start in the corner, uh, which is a an, the... Um, uh, diffraction limited image a biconfocal microscopy of a pair of cells. You can see the nuclei, which are dark, and then you see these blobs on the outside, which is fluorescence coming from the genomic RNA, but you can't see any detail. The big image is the super resolution image of this same sample. And now there are many things that we can uh, talk about here uh, in a general sort of way. Uh, first of all, there are extended clusters of gRNA, which are many, many copies of gRNA. Uh, and this, this image here, uh, these clusters, if I blow this one up, you see even more very fine detail. The coloring here represents uh, how many molecules, how many single molecules are found in each pixel of the imaging. So uh, these brighter uh, spots have more and more single molecules found, rep representing roughly the density uh, of, uh, of gRNA particles here. Uh, so uh, an amazing structure extending over many microns. Uh, here's another example from another uh, perinuclear region, region close to the nucleus. Uh, and so one can follow the uh, sizes uh, of these structures, of these clusters, the density and the size grows as the infection time increases, time since the cells were infected with a viral particle. Finally, let's look at this other little uh, region over here where you don't have that very bright cluster. And what do you see? You see many tiny puncta on the order of about 70 nanometers in size. Uh, these, are, these are essentially individual gRNA particles that are floating around inside the cell. So uh, information can be gleaned on, on different spatial scales. Okay, let's now turn to double-stranded RNA, the, the hybridized plus and minus strands uh, of the genomic RNA. The double-stranded RNA now will be shown with uh, a magenta color. And the ER, uh, as uh, imaged by the method I already described, will be in green. So this is a two-color super-resolution fluorescence image. Uh, you can see on, on a huge scale, the super-resolution shows uh, amazing detail all over the place. Uh, many of these structures look a lot like ER. The green structures look like ER. But we find the double-stranded RNA are puncta. They're sort of small, round objects that are uh, close to the ER, but not really right on top of it. They're sort of next to the ER. The, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum in these cells has already been modified partly uh, by the infection from the virus itself. So the, the double-stranded uh, RNA 
puncta, uh, range in uh, 100 to 400 nanometers in size, uh, and they're embedded uh, in or near the ER. The distribution of the sizes, however, stays the same as the infection time increases. These objects only grow to about this approximate size. The ER label is, is absent uh, near the dsRNAs, and as I said, they nestle uh, with the ER. Okay, well, this, this is showing that inside the cell there's a, a lot of amazing structures, but uh, let's step back for a moment and look just at the virion particles themselves. You can purify the virus particles uh, outside the cell and then do two-color imaging. And now I'm going to show you imaging of genomic RNA in magenta and spike uh, the, these surface proteins uh, in green. And you would expect that the spike labels should be larger and, and will encapsulate the gRNA approximately. So these super resolution reconstructions now on a 100 nanometer uh, scale bar do show you that. There's essentially uh, round objects uh, that are about uh, uh, 120 nanometers in size measured by spike. Uh, and uh, there is a magenta gRNA inside. Uh, when magenta and green combine, they form these white structures. So there's a clearly concentric uh, organization as you would expect if you were imaging the, the viral particles themselves. Note, note that uh, while there can be uh, lots of different kinds of imaging of viral particles, let's say by electron microscopy, uh, you don't know uh, exactly what is inside. But here, we have specifically labeled this gRNA with those uh, fish probes. And so we know that uh, these, this, uh, these objects inside are in fact genomic RNA as, as they should be, of course. It's not really a surprise. But the point here is that uh, uh, this super resolution microscopy, I, I said it has high spatial resolution. And indeed it does. These resolutions are on the order of 10 nanometers. This is uh, a much, much better than 250 nanometers, but it's not one nanometer. Don't expect it to show every single molecule uh, and every single atom of each one of the proteins but there's still uh, information available by doing this. So if you look inside the cell and look for these virion particles, uh, you can see them sometimes, but rarely. Uh, they're typically found at the cell boundary because they're getting ready to bud off of the cell uh, to, to uh, go and infect uh, other cells. Okay, so uh, one more uh, specific uh, comparison uh, I'd like to uh, emphasize here. Uh, is to show both these viral RNAs, both from the genome and from double-stranded RNA together with, with these different colors, magenta and green. Uh, Diffraction-limited imaging might say, oh, they're overlapping. You see white in the diffraction-limited imaging. But with super-resolution, you don't see white. They're actually separated from one another. They're, they're close, but they're not exactly on one another, except very rare cases. Uh, and I, I like to step back in my mind and look at these images and say, wow, uh, this kind of looks like galaxies, galaxies inside the cell. And in an amazing sort of way, in just one cell that's been infected by the coronavirus, the uh, RNAs uh, of the virus form uh, amazing clusters that are involved in many steps of uh, producing new viral particles. We're not exploring all those other steps just yet, but uh, this is basically the beginnings of all this work. Now, what about SARS-CoV-2? Well, uh, I only have unpublished data to show. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 does require uh, creating the cells in a BSL-3 environment because uh, they, they are dangerous and can infect people. Uh, and, and so we have a facility where we can uh, grow the cells inside a, a proper facility and then uh, uh, fix the cells and bring them outside of the facility since the cells are then safe and then do more labeling. I hope you can see that there's uh, even more exciting images from SARS-CoV-2 coming. 
Uh, there are bigger and more like round structures of the genomic RNA with the double-stranded RNA in them. It's not too different uh, from 229E, but of course, it's much more much more dangerous and therefore much more interesting to to study and try to understand how uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 is uh, behaving when it infects these cells. Um, the summary of this particular area is that imaging is now possible for many targets. There's um, many other proteins that can be labeled by immunofluorescence uh, and many time points, many questions to address. And uh, even in particular, uh, you can add drugs to see how these structures change. Just to mention remdesivir itself briefly for a moment, uh, remdesivir um, is of course one of the early drugs that was used. It turns out to inhibit that RDRP enzyme and uh, our, our imaging of remdesivir treatment on the 229E cells uh, showed that uh, both the uh, uh, numbers of both genomic RNA and double-stranded RNA went down as more and more remdesivir treatment was applied. Uh, but the general structures of these two different objects uh, stayed about the same. Uh, of course, there are other interesting drugs that can be tried. Now, uh, if you don't mind, I now would like to switch to uh, one final topic to talk a little bit about uh, uh, another co connection between single molecule fluorescence and high resolution imaging uh, and, and explain this in this context that there are have been over the last few decades two revolutions in spatial resolution uh, that have transformed cellular imaging. First of all, there's super-resolution optical microscopy, as I have described, and, and with its various relatives. But uh, here I'm just illustrating this nuclear lamina and, and with three-dimensional imaging using a light sheet microscope. You can see that it is a sac uh, that uh, is open in its interior, but it has channels through it. This is a 3D light sheet image from uh, Anakar and Gustafson, my former postdoc. Another area that has been showing great progress and, and uh, progression is cryogenic electron microscopy in both of its forms, single particle um, cryo-EM and tomographic uh, reconstructions of, of larger objects. Single particle is not really a single particle, but it's an averaging of many tens of thousands to millions of, of particles to get a high resolution structure with electron microscopy. Tomography is uh, more appropriate to entire cells, such as this uh, Colobacter crescenta cell that I want to talk about. Using uh, a series of tilts uh, in the electron microscope with a, with a cryo uh, EM capability, you can produce those slices that correspond to a 3D image of this object. And you can see it seems to have very high resolution. And then you see that people can annotate uh, that image, and, uh, pointing out uh, different inclusion bodies or granules, uh, and these little dots that are uh, yellow we'll talk about in a second. But you can also uh, see the cell walls and pili and so on. So now, what do I want to do with these two different um, microscopies? I want to point out that the strengths of super-resolution microscopy are the weaknesses of electron microscopy and vice versa. Strengths of EM uh, can be uh, some of the weaknesses of single molecule. So here's one of those drawings, again, of a bacterial cell from, from good cell. Um, and let's suppose you want to observe it. If you do it with electron microscopy, then what you really see is a grayscale image. You see electron density, uh, and it can look at all objects. Uh, in a sense, you can get high resolution down to a couple of nanometers uh, and a certain degree of cellular context. But what you don't know is which blob is which very well. On the other hand, in single molecule fluorescence microscopy, we label specific proteins or oligos uh, with a fluorescent dye so that we know that the light from that fluorescent dye is right next to the protein of interest or the oligo of interest. So the uh, resolution is down to 10 nanometers, but it's highly specific in terms of where these, what these objects are, they're, but they're on a dark background. Uh, you don't see much cellular context from the single molecules. But if you could put those two together, 
then you would be able to say that these particular blobs inside the cryo-EM picture are particular proteins of a particular type. For example, that protein. So uh, that's the idea of what we what we're pursuing now. We're we have a way to combine these two kinds of microscopy. So uh, I I am going to uh, explain this um, in a moment, but uh, I want to give you a little bit more motivation for this from a different point of view. As I said, those cryo EM image slices have very high resolution, so uh, you can see very fine structures uh, in 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 this uh, bacterial cell. Uh, and the question that I want to pose, which proteins are which in this picture? Of course, you can see a many little black dots. You see the little tiny black dots all over. Uh, those actually are the ribosomes. They're a relatively large structure, and so they're easy to observe uh, when you just look at the uh, electron microscopy image, the cryo-EM image with your eyes. You can also see a region here down at the pole that we're going to talk about more later, where there are essentially no ribosomes. It's a ribosome exclusion region. And it's one of these interesting condensates that are becoming more and more ex exciting in biology. Um, <clears throat> you can also identify the S layer uh, on the outside, a proteinaceous layer, uh, the outer membrane of this bacterium, the peptidoglycan layer in between, uh, the inner membrane. These are all easy to identify. And those are the things that are typically annotated in images. Uh, either by hand or by programs. But where are the other thousands of hidden proteins? You know there's there's thousands of proteins inside the cell, and if you're looking for protein A or protein Q or protein Z, where is it inside the cell? That's the question we want to resolve. So we can do that by correlating single molecule fluorescence localizations and cryo-electron tomography images. And this is really the work of uh, a very talented postdoc, Peter Dahlberg, uh, who, was, who started this work in my lab. And he's now a um, staff scientist at SLAC at Stanford. And the general way that these experiments work are as follows. We take cells, which may be bacteria or they can be mammalian cells, um, and we uh, label the structure of interest with a fluorescent label. Uh, and then uh, we, we uh, drip that solution onto an electron microscopy grid and plunge freeze it into liquid ethane so that the water uh, freezes and becomes transparent vitreous ice. That's very important that it be very transparent and very thin on this electron microscope grid. Um, we're going to, in, in the work I'm going to describe, use a particular fluorescent protein as the label called PAM Kate. It's a protein that we identified as being good for use at low temperatures, at 77 degrees Kelvin. Then we take that sample and place it on a low temperature microscope that works at 77 K. Uh, the liquid nitrogen cools uh, the uh, grid and keeps the grid frozen throughout the entire experiment. But then we can use light to uh, pump the single molecules that are in these cells and collect the fluorescence coming back. We can activate these cells. And if they're photoactivatable, we can turn them on at low concentration. And we can measure the positions of the single molecules. Um, and then uh, we take that frozen uh, grid and keep it in liquid nitrogen and load it in these electron microscopes. Uh, and uh, Pete records low and high magnification images, then uh, registers the two images, fluorescence to electron microscopy, so that you can place spots uh, showing where the fluorescence is located in the cryo-electron tomogram. So that's the basic idea uh, for, this, for this work. And uh, I want to, to point out that uh, there are um, several things that have to be done to, to make this all work well. This is a very new work, only a few years old. So uh, the first things that we needed to do was to validate the method, prove the method, and improve the method. So uh, starting out with a control structure, the control structure uh, is a particular protein called MCPA in Colobacter crescentis. These interesting bacteria divide asymmetrically. One daughter cell has a flagellum, the other has a stalk, but MCPA forms the chemoreceptor array uh, located just inside the, the cell inner membrane. 
So PAMK has been fused to MCPA to make this experiment work. Here at the, in the lower left is uh, a cryo-electron tomogram image of the cell, where if you didn't have anything more than diffraction-limited fluorescence microscopy, you could only place a blob of light uh, on top of this cell. And you can see by blowing it up that this is a pretty good control cell because these two lines represent the uh, chemotaxis array. They, they actually show on edge, edge on of two plates uh, of the chemotaxis array in these cells. So switching to uh, single molecule localizations now, instead of diffraction limited images, we see this sort of data from these experiments. Now, what I'm showing you is a selection of the single molecules that were found of the PAMK MCPA. And they're being shown as these little uh, red circles. Now, why are we using red circles? Well, it's to emphasize that each of these circles is the data from one molecule, a single molecule. Uh, and the center of the circle is the position, the best estimate of the position of that molecule. The radius of the circle is our uh, it is our knowledge of uh, how well we know the position. It's basically the error of that position localization. Uh, it's coming from how many photons we receive from the molecule. Uh, as, an, as a side comment, at low temperatures, we get a lot of photons because these molecules don't photobleach very, very quickly. So we get more photons, therefore we get more precision on the localization of these single molecules, even down to eight nanometers and below for some of these molecules shown here but there is a statistical distribution of the diameters as one would expect. Um, and you can even find molecules that are not in the array. Uh, that could be several things. That could either be a, a portion of the array that is uh, coming out of the surface here, out of this very, very thin cryo-EM slice. That, that's a fluorophore that might be uh, at a higher Z or a lower Z, or it might be a protein that hasn't reached the chemotexas array yet. That's perfectly possible in these cells because the, any protein in the cell is uh, synthesized somewhere, but it may have to take some time to move and find its place inside the cell. <clears throat> um, let's switch. So this uh, these measurements show there's a clear correspondence between the two uh, and meeting the control that we want. Um, Let's switch now to the special structure at the edge, at the end of the cell, that uh, ribosome excluded region, which uh, has proteins in it. Uh, one of the proteins that's known to be there is called POPZ. Uh, but I want to show you what we see when we uh, image POPZ with this technique. And by the way, I, I didn't quite say the name of the technique. We call this correlative imaging by annotation with single molecules or CASM. So you see the idea here, we are now physically annotating the structure because we know where specific single molecules are located. We don't have to guess which structure is which using this method. Uh, if you look for POPZ now, you do see it in this ribosome excluded region. Uh, we have, uh, Pete has been developing advanced grids switching away from the carbon grids, going to metallic electron microscope grids, you can get many, many more localizations. Uh, many more molecules can be recorded uh, at 20 times the intensity for one sixth of the time. So uh, this is doing a better job of beginning to fill out a lot of the localizations or a lot of the positions of the POPC molecules, and they don't seem to form a specific structure. They're, they're quite uh, random in this, uh, in this condensate that's at the end, uh, end of the cell. Okay, so that's the story about CASM, about combining single molecules with, with electron microscopy. And you can see this would have many, many applications throughout many other uh, cells. For example, if you think of mammalian cells, they're too thick to be used in the cryo-electron tomogram. So you have to add slicing uh, to make very, very thin lamella. But then in a thin lamella, you can do exactly this again, correlating single molecule localizations uh, with the electron microscope image. So uh, my story today has been really about seeing the nanoscale. Uh, and the, the reason we're doing this is to achieve a better understanding of biology, both in the normal and in the disease states. It's essential to understand normal biology deeply down on this mechanistic 
uh, nanoscale level. And, uh, there, and then you can also look at the same processes in, in disease situations. So there's many new opportunities and challenges. Uh, we are hoping for improved floor fours with better on-off switching, including at 77K. I did not describe that there is a, there's been a challenge for our work uh, correlating the two because these molecules at 77K give a lot of, a lot of photons, but they don't turn off very easily. You have to wait a long time before they photo bleach. Uh, and so having uh, more control over the photochemistry of the emitters would, would be very nice. You can use these methods to look at biological sensors, molecules that in their fluorescence read out the redox state uh, nearby or the pH nearby or the orientation of the nearby structures, for example, in membranes. Single molecules have dipole moments that can tell you which what's the direction of how is the molecule oriented. And other sensors of biochemistry can, can all be explored. We're excited also that single molecules can be coupled to metallic nanoantennas. Uh, this is a different area of science. It's using the nanoantenna to enhance the pumping radiation and to enhance the emitted fluorescence, but those are being uh, considered for environmental sensors and other applications. There is uh, growing work on non-fluorescent objects with uh, interferometric scattering microscopy. And there are applications beyond bioscience uh, to material science and any other area, let's say polymers, where you're interested in looking uh, and at, at the nanoscale of, of what is going on. So I've illustrated uh, with these galaxies of coronavirus RNA and these hidden molecules in cryo-ET that a single molecule super resolution microscopy provides a nanoscale view into biological systems of, of, bio, of biomedical importance. I did not talk about single molecule tracking, but it's another exciting area uh, in, in which you can look at a single molecule in a living cell as it moves around inside the cell. And by measuring its track, measuring where it is as a function of time, you can extract transport information, diffusion coefficient, binding processes, dynamics, and, and many other signals, in addition to all of these readouts that I, that I mentioned earlier, from the, from the spectrum of the molecule to its, uh, or any of these other readouts that you might be interested in as a function of position inside the cell. So uh, we think that there's a great deal of promise for the future and, and are looking forward to the exciting things that will be going on uh, in, in many laboratories around the world. So I want to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, my past students, postdocs and collaborators, and, and the current, we call ourselves the guacamole team, of course, um, this there there has uh, I've reported on work from several of these people uh, today, and mentioned uh, Pete Dahlberg and Leonard Merkel. I want to thank our funding agencies for this, uh, and uh, in partic uh, particularly the National Institute of General Medical Sciences of the NIH. Uh, we have a no ensemble averaging loco, uh, logo, which is uh, useful when we're thinking about single molecule spectroscopy. Uh, and I want to uh, thank you very much for your attention and thank once again the organizers uh, of, of this uh, scientific innovation series uh, for allowing me to, to speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very inspiring talk. And uh, it's great to envision the how single molecule is unraveling new uh, biology. Um, We'll now move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Ha Tech-Jib. Uh, he's a professor of biological chemistry and molecular pharmacology at Harvard University. Uh, he is the pioneer of FRET, fluorescent resonance energy transfer to investigate questioning cancer and infectious disease. Uh, he studied physics at Seoul National University and received a PhD in physics from UC Berkeley. Today he is going to talk about conformational control from single molecules to biotechnologies. So I'd like to thank um, the Che Foundation for this opportunity and for organizing this wonderful event. And uh, it's a great honor to uh, speak right after Professor Morner, who is a pioneer of single molecule uh, science and super resolution microscopy, and uh, he has uh, 
uh, influenced uh, my thinking and research ever since when I was a grad student in California. So the work uh, that I'll be talking about today uh, are based on research done uh, both at, at Johns Hopkins University and also University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So I uh, studied physics uh, for many years. So proteins meant just one thing to me, is something that you eat. So it came to me as a surprise when I learned that proteins are actually molecular players that in perform important functions inside the living cells. And here is an example of a molecule called kinesin uh, moving a cargo along the cellular highway called microtubules using ATP as the fuel molecule. So they are also called the nanomachines because they perform uh, uh, important functions for the cells, just like machines that we made, but they are also very small at the nanometer length scale in size. Proteins have a very precise structures defined at the atomic resolution. They also uh, undergo uh, conformational changes between different conformations or different structural states. And these changes are very important for their function because if they are remaining in a single structure conformation, they are not able to perform their functions. To measure these uh, conformational changes of single proteins and single biomolecules, we develop a technology called a single molecule FRET. Imagine having a protein uh, with two major conformations shown here. On the left, if you put two dyes, green and red, on the protein at two locations, when they are far away from each other in one conformation, uh, in the backswing conformation, then exciting the green dye will give you green emission. But in the other conformation, the dyes are close to each other, so exciting the green dye will result in transfer of the excitation energy from the green to the red molecule, and you get red signal coming from the molecule. So even when you cannot see the details of the protein structure because of the resolution of optical microscopy we learned about from Dr. Mona's talk, we can just look at the color, whether it's green or red, or in between, to de deduce what's going on. So that's the concept for this technology. Today, uh, I will talk about two uh, proteins uh, that are uh, sharing one common property in that they are uh, both known to unwind or unzip DNA. The first is uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, that unwinds the DNA to compare the sequence within the DNA with the sequence of the guide RNA it brings for uh, creating um, the first step in genome editing. The second class of proteins are known as helicases that move along the DNA to convert double-strand DNA into single strands so that uh, we can provide uh, the template for DNA repair and other important functions involving the DNA. So let's start with the first uh, topic, CRISPR-Cas9. More than 10 years ago, a Time magazine had uh, a story about this famous actress. and She uh, chose to undergo a highly invasive surgery because she had a mutation uh, in a gene uh, where her mutation implies that she has a higher than 50% of a chance getting uh, breast cancer or an ovarian cancer. But wouldn't it be wonderful if you can simply fix the mutation in the gene instead of having to uh, perform a surgery? So this was a science fiction in 2012 when this uh, issue was published but it, it is no longer a science fiction because of the revolutionary technologies that are being developed uh, for genome editing. In fact, uh, this has become so uh, powerful and um, uh, enabling that the, the technology known as CRISPR and Cas9 uh, uh, has uh, uh, resulted in the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020 uh, for the two scientists shown here. So this is a technological platform for uh, genome editing. And uh, once, once there is a, a, a Nobel Prize, maybe, perhaps you cannot call it new anymore, 
but we can still call it a young uh, uh, technological platform that can still be improved, uh, made better uh, through additional uh, developments. In CRISPR-based genome editing, uh, there's a protein, Cas9, uh, shown here. It binds to a piece of RNA, uh, guide RNA. And the red segment shown here is a segment of the uh, RNA that uh, is complementary to the sequence in the target DNA in the genome. Then Cas9 brings RNA to the target DNA uh, inside a cell, first recognizing a motif uh, known as PAM, uh, shown here. And then uh, it binds the DNA to unzip the DNA into single strands. And then one of the unzipped strands then base pairs with the guide RNA to form this RNA-DNA uh, duplex. And when the matching is good, this uh, unwinding of the DNA and base pairing with the guide RNA continues until you reach about uh, 17 base pairs of a uh, match, and then the enzyme, uh, the protein, undergoes a conformational change to cut the DNA at two locations, creating uh, what's known as a DNA uh, break. Once this is done, the cell will take care of the rest of the steps for genome editing uh, by uh, using existing uh, mechanisms for DNA repair to, uh, uh, to uh, produce the repaired uh, DNA. Uh, if everything goes well, uh, we can, for example, uh, create an insertion in the sequence so that uh, for a cancer-causing gene, you can actually inactivate the gene to uh, 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 prevent cancer from occurring. So this is uh, the concept behind genome editing. There are many uh, important uh, advances in this field, uh, including uh, very promising human therapeutic um, uh, uh, methods and clinical trials. But there remain uh, uh, many challenges, uh, largely uh, uh, potential safety issues. So CRISPR-Cas9 can actually cut at a sites in the genome that are not the target sites, so these uh, effects are uh, caused by unintended cleavage of the DNA at off-target sites, and these off-target effects uh, are kind of uh, unavoidable uh, uh, if you use the original uh, Cas9 protein because they evolved in, in bacterial cells where DNA is much, much smaller in size, at least 1,000 times smaller, so they didn't have to actually uh, evolve uh, a specificity uh, find the exactly this uh, correct sequence. So uh, if you think about the uh, issue of specificity and how you well you can actually avoid off-target effect, you can think of uh, Cas9 as a protein that is in search of its partner. So it's unwinding the target DNA and asking the following question, are you my partner? By examining the sequence using the guide RNA it is bringing along. Because uh, uh, the unwound DNA uh, would uh, be larger in uh, uh, size, we can then uh, use a single molecule thread to study this DNA unwinding process by putting uh, green and red dye molecules on the two strands of the DNA. So in this case, fully unwound DNA that shows a great match uh, with the guide RNA, the con uh, good target sequence, would actually give you a strong uh, green signal because of uh, large separation will not give you uh, energy transfer from green to the red molecule. So when you look at single uh, DNA Cas9 uh, complexes, when you have a perfect match, uh, then uh, for original Cas9, you get mainly green signal. Uh, so that's uh, basically uh, green light uh, that tells the protein to go and cut the DNA to start the genome editing process. But when you don't have a good match, then you get mainly uh, red signal. Uh, Again, it's the, uh, the red, red light that tells the protein do not cut. The problem is that when you have a partially matching sequences, instead of giving you the red light, uh, the pr uh, protein actually uh, is confused, uh, is flickering between the green and white, the red light, and that actually uh, results in the cleavage of uh, imperfectly matched uh, sequences. And that can result in the off-target effects and causing safety issues. So scientists have developed uh, improved uh, Cas9 molecules and have shown that, indeed, using these engineered Cas9s, you can get much higher uh, fidelity in finding and cutting the, only the intended uh, sequences. 
when you perform a single molecule threat measurement, we could indeed show that even for the partially matching sequences, they're able to say uh, uh, form a no, uh, so that uh, uh, the proteins do not uh, cut the DNA to avoid off-target effects. There's another uh, limitation of the existing CRISPR-Cas9 technology in that this uh, protein is a pair of scissors that are not synchronous, asynchronous scissors, meaning that we don't actually know when a DNA cutting reaction occurs. We don't have a way to control the timing of DNA cutting. This means that uh, we are not able to actually study early steps of uh, DNA repair and gene editing uh, processes. So we de developed a te technology that we called a very fast CRISPR on demand. Here we allow Cas9 protein, the PF scissors, to bind the target DNA, but not cut the DNA because of a photoclavable blockade uh, sitting on uh, the scissors. Then we, when you shine light to remove the blockade, then only then the prebound uh, Cas9 will uh, close, cutting the DNA very fast, just in a few seconds. So how does it work? We, uh, uh, we can actually uh, insert a photoclavable Cajun groups to the guide RNA so that uh, even after finding the target DNA, it does not fully unwind the DNA, uh, stopping at uh, the pre-bound uh, state. Then we shine light to remove the Cajun groups, and then the reaction will complete to fully unwind the target DNA and cutting the DNA and starting the DNA repair process and genome editing. So if you want, uh, we uh, let the Cas9 proteins, all of the cells, to start from a single uh, starting point where Cas9 is already bound to the target DNA, uh, waiting for the signal that we deliver using light. And only then they will synchronously start the reaction. This works really well uh, in living cells. So here I'm plotting uh, the number of uh, percentage of DNA uh, cut uh, as a function of time after shining uh, light. And in our method, we can see that even at the earliest time point of 30 seconds, more than half the DNA molecule has been cut. And this is much faster than the previous record, uh, which took almost an hour to reach uh, the maximum uh, uh, activity. And, uh, and even at that time point, uh, our method actually has a higher activity. So these methods can cut the DNA in seconds after shining light. Now we can begin to use it to study DNA repair in uh, high time resolution. Because we are using light, we can also use the uh, light-based technology to uh, control uh, CRISPR and Cas9 activation uh, in space. So imagine having an embryo of many, many uh, single cells. And each cell carries two copies of the same gene, uh, shown in green, uh, one from your mom, the other from your dad. And then uh, if you uh, shine light only to uh, one of these many cells, then only that cell will show uh, red uh, proteins arriving at the green dot, uh, where red proteins are labeled with a red fluorescent protein uh, to light up the green uh, uh, locations with uh, fluorescence. So if you can sh demonstrate this, we can demonstrate CRISPR activation at single uh, cell resolution. Here's an actual uh, demonstration. We have uh, three cells uh, at the beginning, and each cell shows two green dots, uh, two copies of the same gene. And then uh, we uh, shine light only to the cell in the middle, and then uh, observing this cell uh, will show that over time, the green dots turn yellow as red uh, repair proteins arrive eventually turning uh, itself into uh, red. Uh, in contrast, the two other cells that didn't see the light uh, do not show any uh, red protein accumulating on the green dots, showing that, yes, we can indeed activate CRISPR at the single cell resolution. We can even go further. Uh, we can focus the laser beam to a, a single green dot to trying to activate uh, CRISPR uh, at the single copy of the gene or single allele resolution. And this was actually uh, possible uh, after uh, several weeks of trial. So when it worked the first time, uh, 
Yang Nui in the lab uh, took out his phone to take a video of the movie, first movie. So the movie I'll show you will be shaky. But basically, uh, uh, there are two green dots. And he's shining light only on the bottom left uh, green dot. And uh, as you can see in the movie, uh, only that one uh, will uh, uh, recruit the red uh, cloud, uh, showing that we can indeed uh, achieve uh, crisp activation now at a single allele resolution. We can also do this many times uh, and show that in the vast majority of the cases, only the copy that saw the light will cruise the uh, red repair protein, but not the other. So now we are enabling uh, precision genome editing in 5D, the 1D coming from a precision in genomic coordinate, and then uh, another uh, dimension a long time, and 3D in space. So imagine having a robot sitting on the target DNA, waiting for your signal uh, patiently uh, that you deliver using light. Only then it'll cut the DNA to start the genome editing process. You can pursue many interesting applications. Uh, you can study uh, DNA repair of many different genomic locations. We can uh, uh, imagine using the method to uh, perform uh, genome editing at a single allele resolution. And we think that imaging-guided editing can effectively, essentially, uh, eliminate the off-target effects altogether. The second topic is also about a protein that unwinds or unzips the DNA, but they are called the helicases. And they are, uh, but before I go, that, uh, go there, I want to uh, describe yet another single molecule technology uh, called optical tweezers. So I call this chopsticks are made of light, where you uh, focus your laser beam uh, to a tiny spot, then you can grab a microsphere, uh, just like grabbing uh, an object using uh, chopsticks, and then you can move the laser beam around to apply force to a protein sitting on the surface through a DNA tether. And this way you can apply piconeuron uh, forces and examine the molecular response uh, uh, purely mechanically. This is not a new idea. Uh, in fact, uh, throughout the human history, we have uh, learned that information can be extracted uh, by stretching, uh, for example, asking the DNA, how flexible are you? So in my lab, we decided to combine a single molecule thread with optical tweezers so that we can uh, measure conformational changes of single molecules using fluorescence, but as a function of applied uh, force. Coming back to the helicases, so helicases are enzymes that unwind uh, DNA or unzip uh, DNA, they use uh, ATP uh, as a fuel molecule uh, to power themselves along the DNA backbone. And in this animation, uh, you can see that ATP is coming in, and each cycle of conformational changes, a single base pair of the DNA is unwound by uh, this helicase enzyme. So we've been studying um, uh, an enzyme, a protein called UVLD, helicase important for DNA repair in bacteria. It unwinds the DNA but it's known to be a poor unwinder, meaning that if you have a single copy of the protein, it unwinds DNA very poorly. It has two uh, different uh, conformations, open and close. We can label the protein uh, using green and red dye molecules so that we can actually distinguish between uh, the two forms uh, in terms of uh, this distance between them, or giving you high thread versus uh, low thread. The question uh, that uh, we asked was which of the two is functional for DNA unwinding? Uh, to answer this question, we put uh, this protein into a high-resolution optical tweezers instrument so you can apply force to the DNA and measure DNA unzipping uh, at single base pair resolution. And at the same time, you can use a confocal microscopy to measure thread from a single protein. And from these measurements, uh, we have shown that there are two uh, thread states, uh, two conformational states. In this one conformation, that gives you uh, this high thread or closed uh, conformation. Velocity of the enzyme is positive, meaning that enzyme protein is unwinding the DNA. But in the open conformation, 
shown by this lower fret state, velocity is negative, uh, meaning that enzyme is going backward. So uh, in a sense, the closed form is a uh, go signal, and the other is uh, a signal that tells the protein to go back. So based on this mechanistic understanding, we decided to uh, use chemical cross-linking to staple uh, the protein into the unwinding active uh, closed form, thereby disabling uh, the open form that uh, usually uh, causes enzymes to go back uh, on its track. And this actually uh, uh, makes the enzyme really uh, a really imp impressive uh, superhelicase as shown here. So we can use uh, uh, optical tweezers to measure this, uh, this uh, cross-linked enzyme's movement along the DNA during unwinding and show that uh, the enzyme that used to be very uh, uh, poor in unwinding uh, can now unwind uh, many thousands of base pairs of DNA uh, processively uh, without falling off even against strong opposing uh, force. So uh, really exciting. We can now create uh, a super elite case uh, by simply uh, stapling that protein into the active form. Again, based on the mechanistic knowledge we have gained from advanced single molecule measurements. So in my lab, we've been actually using uh, this uh, superhelic case for many different biotechnological applications. I'll share with you uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, first, we can actually use the superhelic case that we uh, invented to amplify DNA at a constant temperature. There's a really popular, really uh, amazing technology called a PCR, polymerase chain reaction, that can start with a single DNA molecule and then uh, amplify this DNA exponentially to many, many uh, DNA molecules. That's important for biotechnology, uh, disease diagnosis, and many other applications. But this requires an expensive instrument uh, that can go back and forth between two uh, different temperatures because to start the next cycle, you have to uh, un unwind, you have to melt the DNA. But if you have a superhelicase uh, that we developed, we can actually uh, just use a superhelicase to unwind the DNA to start the next cycle. And we have shown in this publication that uh, at a constant temperature, you can amplify DNA as long as uh, uh, 6,000 base pairs and use it for uh, many actually standard applications that usually uh, that require PCR uh, uh, method or uh, uh, thermal cycling uh, instrument that, that costs us uh, several thousand dollars uh, to uh, purchase. In an unpublished study, uh, we have also shown that for uh, tricky uh, DNA molecules sequences that uh, need to be amplified, uh, where you have uh, uh, repeats of the same sequence, the conventional uh, PCR method gives you uh, many different products and large smears, whereas our method, we call, call a sharp, gives you a nice uh, single uh, defined uh, product. So it's not only uh, cheap and easier to use, it can also give you uh, some results that are not achievable using the conventional method. So here's one example of uh, using our super early case uh, for biotech applications. Second example uh, is precision genome imaging uh, using uh, the super early case. So if you want to image the genomic DNA inside the human cells, for example, uh, we typically use uh, the conventional method uh, called um, DNA fish, and uh, where here we use uh, global denaturing of the uh, genes um, by heating the cell to uh, 85 degrees in Celsius. And then after that, you uh, add DNA sequences uh, that are complementary to the target DNA uh, of interest with the fluorescent labels. So you can actually uh, highlight uh, regions of interest inside uh, the cell. In our uh, method, uh, based on CRISPR and uh, superhelicase, we perform uh, genome uh, denaturing uh, only locally using our superhelicase at a Cas9 uh, NIC. So here's how it works. So we have a Cas9 uh, that can be directed to the site of interest using a particular guide RNA sequence. And this is made to uh, make only one cut. Uh, and then 
uh, from the cut uh, generated by the Cas9, uh, you can load uh, uh, superhelicase, which will then uh, continue to move along the DNA, unwinding the downstream DNA up to about 2,000 base pairs. And then, and then produce the single chain DNA can be used as a target for uh, uh, probes that are labeled with a fluorescent molecule. So that it, now we can decorate only the region of interest with multiple probes and uh, denature the region of interest only, but nowhere else. This gives you much higher um, uh, signal to background ratio, improving the sensitivity and also uh, reducing perturbations of the cellular structures because we don't actually heat the sample to a very high temperatures in this method. So let me show you uh, one example of using this method to image gene amplification in uh, human breast cancer tissue. There's a gene called HER2 that is amplified to hundreds of copies in a particular types of breast cancer. And uh, by uh, performing our method on uh, this uh, human tissue sample, we can indeed see that many of these uh, cells are marked by the red, uh, uh, sorry, uh, blue for uh, staining the genomic DNA, show uh, uh, dozens of uh, uh, yellow clusters corresponding to uh, many copies of the HER2 uh, gene due to gene amplification. But if you look at the same tissue but slightly away from uh, the center, now you see uh, many normal cells in the normal parts of the tissue, and each cell show, uh, shows you only uh, two copies of uh, the same gene because uh, here, the normal cells do not have, uh, have uh, HER2 gene amplification. The, so this method actually really works in, uh, uh, in the tissue setting and accurately reporting on the gene amplification uh, status. We can be uh, more ambitious uh, uh, by going to uh, the next level of sensitivity, but before I go there, I just want to mention that uh, we uh, named this technology uh, Goldfish uh, due to, uh, for... Uh, uh, the LD standing for local uh, denaturing. And here you can imagine uh, the fish carrying a, a paintbrush uh, to paint uh, the genomic regions of interest. We can use a goldfish now uh, to image single point mutations. The so famous uh, disease, uh, uh, Hutchison Guilford progeria syndrome, is caused by a mutation, a uh, single point mutation in lamin A gene. And uh, this causes uh, uh, severe uh, uh, issues, uh, in, especially in young children. So uh, due to generous support from the Progeria Foundation, we uh, acquired uh, patient-derived uh, Progeria cells, and we used a uh, single permutation uh, sensitive uh, goldfish method to detect uh, these cells and show that we can see only one copy of the mutated uh, uh, gene. But if you use CRISPR-based editing to restore the functional copy of the lamin A gene and image the correct uh, uh, gene uh, using the wild type probe, we can now see uh, two copies of the functional gene um, uh, in each of the uh, uh, CRISPR-edited uh, 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 cells. All right, uh, so let me uh, summarize. Uh, I have uh, shown you uh, two different uh, uh, types of proteins that can unwind the DNA. The theme here is that we can first use single molecule technologies to learn uh, what different protein conformations are good for, uh, for their function, and then use uh, the knowledge gained to develop uh, new biotechnologies and potentially therapeutics, and, uh, and by con controlling uh, the conformational stage of these proteins. And I have uh, also highlighted uh, some of the people who have uh, done the work uh, together with many of our uh, recent and uh, distant past collaborators. Thank you so much. Okay. I'd like to uh, thank Professor Ha for uh, his enlightening talk on how science and the mechanism of single molecules to uh, reach into the technologies of engineering life. Next, we'll be moving on to Professor uh, Myung Sua. Uh, she's professor of biological chemistry and molecular pharmacology at Harvard University. She investigates unsolved biomedical uh, problems like cancer, neurodegeneration with single molecule precision. Uh, she studied molecular biology at UC Berkeley 
and received PhD in nutrition biochemistry from UC Berkeley. So he's going to talk about the built-in genetic switch for transcription and translation. Thank you for having me. I would like to thank the Che Institute for inviting me. And, um, and I want to thank all the staff members here uh, who are working behind the scenes as I speak. And uh, yeah, what a pressure it is to <laughs> have to talk after Dr. Warner and uh, Dr. Ha. But I'll uh, do my best to tell uh, our interesting um, projects. Uh, so, uh, as you've seen in my uh, introduction, I'm a biologist by training, so I'm a more of a tool user. I fell in love with biophysics uh, during my postdoc years when I was able to see uh, helicase moving on DNA. Uh, and since then, I've been using, uh, taking advantage of the single molecule tools to look at various uh, fun processes that happen in biology. So uh, what you're looking at on this cover page is uh, a depiction. It's kind of a movie uh, depicting uh, busy molecules traveling down on the molecular tracts of streets. So you can think of them as uh, cars on highways, right? And imagine a big city like Seoul or New York or LA, uh, you have lots of traffics. So uh, for the traffic to be uh, running in control and smooth uh, uh, ways, you need to have rules and regulations. You need to have stops and go and slow down and speed up type of signs uh, for uh, healthy and smooth um, flow of the traffic. Just like that in our molecular highways, there are machines that run, but also there are uh, signs that uh, get put on. And so one of the ways uh, uh, that uh, the cells use to sign their or uh, control their traffic is by using uh, structure. So I want to draw your attention to that topic. So, okay. So sometimes by looking at structure, we can uh, expect a function. So let me give you an example of a chair uh, that has the right dimension and right orientation and the shape so that we can use it for sitting and we can relax. So sometimes structure reveals function, but not always, right? Sometimes a structure can be given, let me take an example here, of a furniture that looks like this. So you can see that uh, this is used as a cupboard uh, uh, or storage sh shelves that um, you can put many different things for organization. But what's next to it is kind of a mysterious structure. And when I first looked at this picture, I thought it would be a cabinet for storing more things, maybe light sensitive things, maybe precious things that you want to hide behind. But when it's full blown into uh, the real structure, you can see that it reveals a new function that you cannot imagine from looking at just the structure itself. Just like this, um, in our cells, there are some structures that we can look at, we can monitor and detect and measure, uh, but that sometimes reveals a new function. So that, uh, let me go through uh, uh, this textbook definition of transcription. So transcription is a process by which DNA, the message in the DNA gets in uh, decoded, by uh, RNA polymerase. So unlike the RDRP that Dr. Warner talked about, this is a D, uh, DDRP, so DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So the cycle goes like this. So you have an RNAP binding to a DNA at a well-known promoter site, and it will uh, start transcribing. So it goes down the track of DNA and eventually makes a um, transcript, which is a mRNA. So at the end of one cycle, you can imagine that the template will uh, uh, be back to the duplex DNA, and this is the product of single-stranded RNA. Now, um, what I'm going to talk to you about is a special case when DNA looks the same, but possesses a special sequence that uh, when uh, it becomes a single-stranded uh, state, it can fold into a special structure. So the question that we're asking is, uh, you know, does it impact this uh, movement of this protein and eventually uh, the pro uh, production of the mRNA? So that would be the, sec uh, the, the first part of my talk. But second part of my talk, I'm going to move into translation and ask a similar question. So translation is a process by which the message in the RNA gets read by uh, this huge machinery called ribosome, 
which binds to the uh, transcript and flows or translocate down the mRNA, making a protein. And that code of that protein is dictated by the mRNA sequence. So eventually, um, RNA gets released, and uh, there comes the protein as a product. But it's a similar question. What if the RNA contains a certain sequence that can fold into a structure? Then uh, does it impact ribosome loading, movement, and making of the protein? So the, this special uh, structure and uh, that's derived from this sequence um, I want you to focus on is the G quadruplex. Uh, so it forms in both DNA and RNA, the single-stranded. And the requirements for G quadruplex formation is these runs of Gs, high guanine content, or uh, uh, successive Gs followed by non-Gs. So if you have a sequence that has this kind of composition, the uh, the nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, would autonomously fold into a G quadruplex structure. And this was shown to form in human cells. So what it looks like is shown here. From top down, you have four Gs hooked in base pairing. So you have this uh, kind of flat layer that is stabilized by monovalent cations, such as potassium. So this is a, a plane um, called the tetrad plane, from the side view, you can see this plane uh, is stacked up, up on top of each other. And so this structure, G quadruplex itself, can be uh, highly stable. And its melting temperature could amount to uh, 90 degrees or uh, higher, 90 degrees Celsius or higher. So when does it form? It turned out that it forms during replication and transcription, also translation, as I will show you. Basically, when uh, this special sequence uh, labeled red, becomes single-stranded, this can pop up into a structure, right? as I've shown you here. So that uh, is what happens in replication and transcription. Du duplex DNA gets melted into single-stranded uh, state, and that within the single strand, this structure can uh, fo fold. So it turned out that human, uh, there are abundant, about uh, on the order of 400,000 uh, G, Q, G quadruplex forming sequences in human genome. If we look at the positions of them, it's not even in its distribution. It's rather uh, highly selective. So we can see these uh, peaks and valleys throughout the human genome. And uh, it, is, it is highly enriched in oncogenes and regulatory genes, but uh, depleted in housekeeping genes, uh, revealing its uh, or indicating its potential function as a regulator of gene expression. So uh, amongst these uh, peaks, we chose a 5' prime UTR as a position of G quadruplex and uh, asked the question, does it make a difference in terms of transcription and later translation? So uh, in other words, is GQ a go sign or stop sign, slow down or speed up sign? Okay, so the way that we measure transcription in solution, in ensemble solution, is um, shown here. So we have, this is important to remember, the top strand will be always non-template strand, and the bottom will be template strand. And so we locate a promoter here, and we position G quadruplex forming sequence either on top non-template strand or on the bottom template strand. And then when it transcribes RNA, we have a molecular probe that is dark in solution, but it will light up when it binds to transcript. So that by looking at the fluorescence that emerges from the molecular beacon, we can track the uh, transcription rate. So we just measure the intensity. So in simple terms, here is our solution uh, that contains all the um, ingredients that's, that's needed for transcription. And by collecting fluorescence over time, Right, it becomes greener and greener. Uh, we can uh, plot this over time axis and deduce the transcription rate. So this is a solution-based measurement. So when we carried out this measurement for many G quadruplex forming sequences, we found out that um, in all cases, we have higher transcription when the GQ is located in non-template than in template. So that was the case for many different GQ forming sequences as shown here. So we wanted to test this, uh, move this uh, to a single molecule platform. So we carried out the same assay, except 
Uh, in single molecule, we have DNA that's tethered to single molecule surface, so then we can watch what happens to individual molecules of DNA over time. So when we run the same assay with the molecular beacon, uh, the uh, result that we expect is demonstrated here. Each individual DNA molecule will undergo transcription and light up right, whenever there's a transcription event. So when we uh, obtain data from individual, hundreds of individual molecules, we expect to see these spikes of green signals. Uh, so each one um, indicating individual uh, events of transcription. So you will have, uh, so each of these data I'm depicting here would come from individual single DNA molecules. So what does it look like in real life? We actually see these green spikes that emerge. There's also a background increase because we have accumulation of green signal in solution, but we can dis uh, de definitely discern these um, spikes of green signal that indicates individual uh, transcription events. So when we uh, tabulate this result, again, we see the same relationship that GQ located on non-template produces higher transcription than in template and in control sequence. Uh, that's a non-GQ forming sequence that's in gray. So the question, obviously, is how is it happening? Why do we see increased transcription when the GQ is located in non-template? To answer this question, we devised um, five different single molecule tracking sta uh, stages uh, to look at each step of the way. Right? First, we will look at the binding of RNAP, uh, followed by the initiation of transcription and elongation through the G quadruplex forming sequence. And we focused on the elongation um, uh, of the across the GQ sequence. And then lastly, we look to see if there's a GQ formation in the DNA. OK, let me go through it one by one. So RNAP binding. This is a assay, very simple assay um, where, where we have uh, just one fluorophore located near the promoter, such that RNAP binding will uh, make the fluorophore bright. This is called the protein-induced fluorescence enhancement that uh, we developed um, uh, some 15 years ago or so. So PIFE assay is powerful because you, don't, you just need one label, and whenever the protein cont or binds nearby it, it will light up the uh, fluorophore. So by uh, looking at the green signal spikes, we can determine when the RNA polymerase binds the promoter. So as expected, as a f uh, function of RNA P concentration, we see more and more frequent uh, spikes of green light. Uh, when we look at the RNAP binding for uh, three different sequences, we see no difference because this is upstream of the G quadruplex. Uh, everything is the same. Next, we look at initiation of transcription, which is an important uh, controlling step. So this is done by uh, FRET imaging, which TJ uh, already talked about. So there are two dyes, and we measure the distance between the two by looking at the fluorescent signal. So when uh, RNAP binds and opens a transcription bubble, the dye-to-dye -dye distance is slightly um, increased, uh, decreased, I'm sorry, decreased so that the FRET goes up uh, slightly. So that is seen by uh, individual FRET molecules, uh, FRET individual molecules of uh, FRET signal. Uh, and as expected, as a function of NTP concentration, you have a higher and higher uh, FRET event that depicts um, uh, the more uh, higher rate of initiation. So when we look at that, there's no difference, right? Because it hasn't really gotten to the GQ uh, yet. So it uh, is about the same in all three substrates. So now let's look at uh, the elongation, which is really the race from green dye to the red dye. So this is not FRET, although there are two dyes. It's located outside of the FRET detective, uh, detecting uh, sensitive region. So we actually look at uh, the green signal lighting up when the RNAP binds, and then it, it, uh, when it gets to the red signal, then we see the red signal um, increase. So what it looks like is shown in these um, single molecules. Uh, sometimes it fails. So the protein binds to the green signal. It doesn't make it all the way to the red signal. But all the successful events will have tandem green-red green -red signals, as you, you can see. So we can uh, track the successful elongation, which will give us uh, the green-red signal in tandem. 
And when we tabulate that result, we do see that non-template transcription is um, higher than the other two cases. So uh, this tells us that, uh, uh, that we it, it is within this uh, travel distance from the promoter down to the GQ that um, something is different about the non-template than the template and the control. So the fourth platform is, um, looks like this. Two dies are located across G quadruplex so that we can look at the transcription as RNAP goes through the G quadruplex element. So when we look at it, uh, there's nothing very special about the traces because it looks about the same as initiation. There's a momentary uh, transient FRET increase every time RNAP passes through the G quadruplex region. And when we uh, look at the result, um, here again, non-template has higher transcription events than the other two cases. Okay, so there's something going on here, but what is that something uh, that is different about the non-template? So this, um, just to save time, I'm not going to go through the, uh, all the data, but what we learned is um, that there is an unexpected FRET decrease that uh, somehow when the RNAP is passing through this G quadruplex element, the two dyes become much far, uh, farther apart than where it should be, right? So the, there's an unexpected FRET decrease uh, that we were first puzzled. So then we um, collected this transcription mixture and ran it through the gel, as shown here. And what we see is this unexpected high molecular weight band that we didn't expect to see. So the band of the DNA that we're using should all be down he here. But in addition to that, we saw something that uh, lies far uh, upstream, so higher molecular weight. So what is that? So it turned out that there is a formation of what's called the R loop. So R loop, as shown here, is a triplex structure. So there's a pairing between mRNA and template down here, um, and then there's a displaced non-template strand. So this triplex uh, is called um, R loop. And it turned out that uh, it's highly pr uh, prone to form in the G-rich um, regions of the DNA, and which we have. So, uh, so this is what um, turned out to be the case. There's a formation of R this special structure called R loop. So DNA topology changes right, as a result of transcription. So to check if it, this is really our loop, we um, use this specialized um, enzyme called RNAs H that removes an R loop, removes the RNA part of the uh, R loop. So when we use the RNAs H um, enzyme, uh, this is before and after the unexpected yellow band completely disappears, and from our FRET histogram, this unexpected purple um, uh, histo histogram peak that I'm depicting here also completely disappears, which confirms that this indeed um, is due to the R loop formation. Okay, so the emerging picture so far is that there is a successive formation and release of the R loop, right? R loop is of, uh, R loop forms as a result of transcription, but it's also released to produce a lot of mRNA. So there has to be successive R loop formation and release. What about uh, the top strand, right? The, uh, this is the G-rich strand in the non-template. So to examine that, we uh, moved to the last single molecule platform where we located two dyes right across the GQ forming region on the same strand. And indeed, um, it, uh, it does fold into G quadruplex. So the emerging picture um, is shown here. Um, and also the function of the GQ. So it turned out that when you have a uh, GQ, it stabilizes the R looped state. So the order of event is that you form R loop first and then the GQ. But once the GQ folds, it um, actually stabilizes the R loop form state. So two are become synergistic structures. So more GQ more drives more R loop. But does it matter for the transcription? Does the more GQ, more R loop mean more mRNA? And it turned out uh, the answer is yes. Uh, kind of counterintuitively, when these bulky structures form in DNA, you actually generate a lot more transcripts, or about 30% about more transcripts than when you don't have it. So um, this, let's revisit the textbook picture of uh, transcription, where RNAP makes transcripts and exits the DNA um, 
and making our, our RNA as a product. But what our um, research has shown is that when there's a special element, it can actually fold and change the DNA topology to uh, this kind of mega structure, and that structure itself is able to drive higher uh, transcription. So uh, this is uh, the same message put in this way. So these structures both are loop and GQ uh, synergistically and promote transcription. So now let me segue into the translation. So now there's this purple strand that forms our loop and that uh, is released as an mRNA. But that um, RNA also has a G-rich sequence, the same sequence uh, as the non-template strand. So what if there's a loop formation in RNA? Would it control translation to any, um, to any different level? So that became our next project. So now uh, to study the RNA G quadruplex in translation, we use a similar assay where we positioned the uh, potential GQ forming sequence uh, here in the upstream um, after the promoter. And then what's in orange is the ribosome binding site. And uh, so when the GQ forming sequence is in the non-template, it will the transcript will have G quadruplex. Then uh, ribosome will bind here and translate the message into green fluorescent protein. So in this assay, uh, simultaneously, we can detect both the transcription and translation events in real time. And so we can determine the translation efficiency by normalizing our data uh, by the transcription. Okay. So it turned out that this is the data that I've already shown you. Uh, when the transcription is enhanced, when the G quadruplex is located in non-template. But this is what we saw in translation. Uh, when the same sequence is um, in the non-template, it actually induces much higher translation. So if you look at the difference here versus here, uh, this translational enhancement cannot be explained by, by the transcription increase, right? It's um, uh, at, le at least an order of magnitude higher. So how is this possible? Uh, we also checked by a chemical probe that indeed there is a GQ formation um, during the translation reaction. Okay, so the task now is determining what is responsible, what mechanism is responsible for this huge enhancement in translation. So we came up with four hypotheses. First, the GQ itself that forms in RNA can be a magnet. It can attract uh, ribosome to itself, and then that uh, induces uh, enhanced translation. Second is the accessibility model. Maybe the ribosome binding site uh, may be trapped in a secondary structure so that it's not accessible, but by for forming a G quadruplex structure, it can uh, make the ribosome binding site more accessible for the ribosome, which can also uh, increase the translation output. Third, perhaps that's, uh, that's not the case. Maybe the folding of the RNA uh, GQ structure can enhance the stability of, of the mRNA. Then RNA uh, lasts a longer time, and that can also contribute to enhanced translation. But fourth um, possibility is that maybe it's a physical uh, barricade or a block uh, that may uh, prevent the ribosomes from falling off and maybe stabilize the bound configuration of the ribosome. So we tested these uh, hypotheses one by one. First, uh, is it a magnet? Is it an affinity um, uh, factor? So to test this, we uh, prepared a whole bunch of RNA. Some of them are shown here. Uh, so if the GQ itself is a magnet, um, by putting in these competitor RNAs that contains G quadruplex, uh, we should be able to lower the enhancement. So that's the idea. So some of the RNA had G quadruplex, and some had nothing, some had ribosome binding site, and some had both elements. And when, when we look at the translation output, what we see is that only the RNA that has ribosome binding site competes very well in this assay. The ones that have just a G quadruplex do not change the translation much. So it turned out that this hypothesis is not correct. Uh, it, our RNA G quadruplex does not attract ribosome directly. OK, 
Okay. Second hypothesis, is it an accessibility factor? So perhaps the RNA G quadruplex formation uh, make the ribosome binding site more accessible for ribosome. So to test for that, we actually used a complementary oligo just to look at the accessibility of the uh, uh, potentially folded region. And when we did that, um, under heat or no heat, we saw the accessibility is just as high as um, uh, in all cases. So it turned out that accessibility is not what's controlling the enhancement of the translation. So the second hypothesis is also wrong. Third hypothesis, does it then uh, increase the stability of the mRNA? To test for this, we uh, ran translation reaction for about three hours, then extracted RNA to look at the level of the RNA um, in three different cases. And as you can see, that there's not much difference. So we tested, tested this by two sets of primers, and uh, there's not much difference between the non-template control and the template. So this also turned out to be not correct. And okay, so it doesn't increase the mRNA stability. The fourth hypothesis, um, this idea came from uh, uh, talking with a, a an expert in ribosome studies, uh, and what he told me was uh, that a lot of times, ribosomes, in, uh, especially in E. coli system, a lot of ribosomes don't make it to uh, translation, it actually falls off. It, uh, it doesn't really scan the RNA, but it has a high propensity to fall off the uh, trans transcript. So then our idea was that perhaps this um, RNA-G quadruplex can be a stability factor, right? By formation, it can uh, stabilize the bound state of the ribosome. To test uh, this hypothesis, we used a specialized helicase, DHX36. This is uh, highly specific to uh, unfold G quadruplex structure, both in RNA and DNA. So in, when we apply this G4 helicase to this assay, um, in a very robust manner, in a dose-dependent way, we lost enhancement, right? Even a one nanomolar of this protein uh, uh, um, de uh, decreased the reaction by about 20%. By uh, adding five nanomolar of DHX36, we basically removed the enhancement. So this turned out to be the case that uh, likely the RNAG quadruplex is serving uh, as a physical barrier. But by blocking uh, the site, upstream site, it may be um, preventing the ribosomes from falling off the transcript. Now, if it's a barrier, then can we make the barrier strength higher by increasing the uh, size of this RNAG quadruplex? To do that, we uh, just expanded the uh, sequence such that we can have a bulkier and bulkier um, RNAG quadruplex and otherwise carried out the same assay. And it turned out that uh, there's a huge difference on the size. So as we bulk off the G quadruplex um, in RNA, it is able to actually enhance even a higher translation. So before the enhancement level was about, um, uh, about two, threefold. Now it goes up to uh, uh, much higher. I think co compared to the, um, to the uh, uh, template GQ, it goes up uh, actually tenfold higher. Um, and this is the data that shows you a high correlation between uh, this uh, size and the translation efficiency. Uh, and then we um, went a step further and added uh, another structural barrier on top of the G quadruplex, and that was a hairpin. So uh, because uh, RNA G quadruplex would be bulking more in the sideways because it's uh, known to form into this formation, we thought to add a height barrier, right, by adding a hairpin of different size. So then you have both the bulk and the height because the ribosome uh, is, bul uh, is bulky, as depict I'm depicting here, sideways and also height-wise. So we thought to uh, make the barrier strength higher by adding a hairpin in addition to the G quadruplex. And when we did that, um, it actually uh, further enhanced translation. So now, uh, with the highest hairpin, we can obtain about a uh, 12-fold increase in translation. Okay, so both the RNAG quadruplex structure and hairpin structure can further promote translation. So this is all the data put together in a, a, form, a format of a heat map. And you can see uh, the x-axis 
is a different RNA G quadruplex going from smaller to a larger size. And then on the y axis, you have a hairpin of a short length to a higher uh, stem length. You can see that there's high correlation um, in terms of the translation. So both structures uh, synergistically promote translation. And uh, this, we think, will be very useful for, uh, for research and biotechnology if you want to tune your translation to fivefold or tenfold or you know, twelvefold. You can actually combine these structural elements to actually drive the translation to a desired level. So the mechanism behind this, as far as we understand, is depicted here. So perhaps when there's no structure, um, ribosome has a high propensity to fall off the transcript and don't make it into a translation product. But with the increased barrier of G quadruplex, or maybe further increase with the hairpin and G quadruplex put together, we can drive translation uh, to uh, over tenfold uh, efficiency. So uh, this is all kind of in vitro data, so we wanted to make sure that this can also be seen in cells, and uh, we, in this case we used uh, E. coli cells. So we had a reporter construct where we had M. cherry and GFP. Uh, so M. cherry would be in internal control that reports on a non-GQ impacted translation, and GFP will be the reporter. So we, um, then we measure the fluorescence of two colors and uh, test the translation efficiency. And also in cells, we can see that um, non-template GQ is the one that shows high translation efficiency, and there's a size uh, dependence, so uh, the large uh, G quadruplex actually drives higher translation efficiency. So, uh, so here I present G quadruplex as a built-in switch that can impact both transcription and translation. And so what we think of is uh, this. When the sequence is masked or hidden within the uh, context of duplex, it is an off state. But when it undergoes transcription, first the R loop can form, and then the G quadruplex can form, and that now the switch is on. And uh, quite unexpectedly, these two topological switches that gets put on the DNA actually upregulates transcription. Furthermore, this RNA that's released from such uh, uh, structure would bear uh, within itself G quadruplex, and that acts as a barrier to uh, stabilize the bound ribosome, and that can um, enhance translation. And by adding the barrier strength, by adding uh, more structural components, we can actually drive the translation upward. So G quadruplex um, is a built-in switch that can impact both processes. So I want to finish my talk by thanking the group members. Uh, Jim and Mira have really spearheaded the project, and Ashley Wang has been a talented undergrad who contributed, and these are the funding sources that supported our work. And thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all the three prominent speakers of today to inspire us how uh, single molecules can change not only the science, but also our life. Um, so speakers, thank you for coming back to uh, the stage for a discussion session. Our discussion will be based on the questions that prepared in advance. <laughs> um, so I'd like to start with the uh, question for Professor Morner. Um, so you earned three undergraduate degrees in physics, electrical engineering, and mathematics. What made you to <laughs> major three very different topics, and what was the most challenging thing to you? <laughs> well, uh, this is a little bit of an interesting story, but it, remember, I was an undergraduate at this time in college, okay? And um, I started as an engineer because I got a fellowship. Uh, to go to Washington University through through a special program. Uh, so that was electrical engineering. And then in, in electrical engineering, you have to take physics. So uh, I started taking physics classes, and I loved them. So I took more physics classes, and then uh, I see that they all use mathematics. You have to take some mathematics <laughs> classes. So I decided, let's take some mathematics. And it turned out that at WashU, you, you could get three degrees if you just meet the requirements for all three. Uh, so uh, many of those courses could be used more than once. So when you work it all out, 
if you just take you know six classes every 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 <laughs> semester or something uh by the by and and place out of a bunch at the beginning you can get three degrees it's, it's a little bit crazy uh but it's just because I, I loved all this i loved all the science i loved all the learning and everything uh, fit together uh, in, in that sense the hardest one and the one that i came closest to not making an a uh <laughs> making a b was in uh the beginning uh mathematics course mm. which is so-called advanced calculus where, where everything is very complicated uh that you have to prove <laughs> with many proofs and so that was the hardest at the beginning but then after that everything was easy differential equations and so forth everything was all straightforward so yeah. actually related <laughs> to that thing um uh the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2014, including yourself, all three recipients are not majored in chemistry, but it was awarded to chemistry. So um, I also get questions like, why chemistry, even though it doesn't look like chemistry? Do you have any um, comments <laughs> on that? Uh, well, I, I don't have any special insight into exactly how the Nobel Committee works. Uh, but in this particular case, it makes some sense because the chemistry prize uh, sort of switches between uh, a, a sort of more standard chemical field and then maybe a method that's important for uh, many areas related to chemistry. So there have been Nobel Prizes in, in uh, mass spectrometry mm -hmm. and other sorts of techniques uh, at, and uh, electron microscopy and so forth. And so uh, in the sense that all of this work on super resolution and single molecules uh, had a lot of physical content, but was a useful method, that's why it could fit within the chemistry prize. That makes sense? That makes sense. Now I have a lo <laughs> Nobel laureate's answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, don't 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 believe that every Nobel laureate is correct, including me. Remember that... Uh, <laughs> You know, it was uh, Erwin Schrodinger who said no one can ever detect and observe a single electron or a single molecule in 1952. That's actually our next question. <laughs> you picked it up exactly. Um, so, yeah, how, how is it like for you to um, challenge yourself on something that uh, Schrodinger may say it's impossible? Well, um, the the answer to that is again kind of a little bit specific to the times um i was working at ibm and we were trying to do data storage and it turned out that you were at that time using light and molecules to record bits in, in a special way at low temperatures um, and so this uh, tunable lasers allowed you to and the behavior of low temperatures allowed you to put bits at different colors many even thousands of bits in one sample in one position and so uh that was an important time because uh that was a technology uh and there was a goal to make this into an application but it was also important to understand all the science behind it all the limitations all the fundamental limits and that was uh, what uh, in, encouraged me to, uh, and when we were studying s signal to noise ratios, uh, to realize that there would be a fundamental noise source on okay. optical storage coming from the number of molecules that you have, something that scaled as the square root of the number of molecules. And that uh, square root dependence is what led me to, to realize this, maybe we could detect a single molecule, the ultimate data storage. Uh, rather than storing uh, each bit in thousands of molecules, can you store a bit in one molecule as an ultimate limit? And so that's why that became a goal uh, to see, can we do it? Okay, and that's, that's what, what drives scientists who are, you know, driven by, let's do something that hasn't been done before. Okay, that, that was quite inspiring. <laughs> I hope the young generation also feels that way. Um, you also uh, picked uh, Michael Faraday as your um, source of inspiration before. So can we also inspire us with his story? Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, the thing, the reason I mentioned Michael Faraday is that he uh, uh, impacted multiple fields. Uh, he impacted uh, both physics and chemistry, and I found that to be very, uh, very inspiring. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 I enjoy multiple fields of science. Uh, I don't fit in a box. Uh, just a chemist, just a physicist, just an engineer. Uh, but, but I like to utilize the good things from each of these fields at the same time. And, and I think that's a, a good message for the students too these days, because uh, you have uh, so many exciting bits of, of uh, science to be discovered at the boundaries between fields. So it, it is a, a good move to, to, of course, learn one field well, but then add other fields later. Why not become a, become a perpetual student and that's what that's how i view myself learning biology you see uh, adding medicine biology <laughs> you see on top of all this stuff so uh, it, it's it's wonderful thank you that's exactly what i feel like too um so now uh we'll expand the questionnaires to all the speakers of the today um so now we have uh a way to look at single molecule that increases the number of uh, variations and also the higher resolution, uh, resolution, spatial resolution and other resolution means more information. So uh, how do you envision the, the recent uh, advancements in machine learning and so, f uh, and so forth uh, will change our understanding in single molecule research? So now the question is open for or three of you. I remember uh, Professor Morner had a, an Israeli postdoc who uh, actually made a really early um, uh, pioneering efforts in bringing machine learning to analyzing single molecule uh, trajectories and data. Maybe then you can actually start because of that. <laughs> w. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it, it turns out okay. Uh, I can do that, but it's it's quite a broad question. If you if you include generative and everything else, uh, I think it's hot these days. But on a on a deep level, uh, a lot of uh, machine learning uh, is well suited to analyzing images uh, because uh, arrays uh, are uh, utilized to display images of cars or people or faces and so on, and 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 it's really looking at patterns. Uh, in those those mathematical objects, so it's it's uh, already happening that uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning, uh, convolutional neural networks are, are, are very useful for extracting information from images quickly. Uh, where are the single molecules? Uh, how do you decide what they're telling you? what parameters do you want to extract from the molecules? So you can train the network to know how to extract uh, information about the molecule. For example, it's X position, Y position, Z position, it's theta orientation and it's phi orientation. So five different variables can be produced from the net. So this is all perfectly reasonable and, and based on training and evaluation and making sure that you quantify errors, okay? But um, the more, the broader issue of uh, generative uh, AI and all of that is um, is very, very new. And uh, I've even find a number of situations where you get wrong information uh, from uh, those sorts of language models. And uh, we're, we're more interested in, in precise information as, as much as possible, as long as possible. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I, so it's, it's important to have uh, good data to train the model on. Uh, so it's ever more important to have human curated uh, single molecule data um, that uh, can be used to train the machine learning algorithms uh, so that these algorithms can make uh, correct uh, calls. Now, uh, will there be a time in the future where you don't need humans anymore in terms of even data curation, right? In, even for training, then uh, perhaps uh, uh, there'll be a different uh, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about like social network 
um, you know, circle of people and finding patterns in their communications and um, and such. If that can be done, you know, if we can eavesdrop the conversations that happen in cells, right, and between different single molecules in time and space. Um, I think that will be possible. So I think the limitation is our detection, right? How many colors can we detect? What's the spatial te temporal resolution? If we can really go drive it uh, upward to uh, really eavesdrop on the conversation of at the single molecule level, I think, uh, yeah, it'll be really fascinating. So, yeah, whether human is no longer needed or not is, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a different question. But. Well, it, uh, I think it's worth, I think everyone will agree that you have to have an assay at the, at the start. You have to design how you're going to use fluorescence, let's say, to tell you something. And, and that's what, what the humans have been really good at. Uh, if it's possible for the machines to get good at that, better at that than we are, that would be pretty exciting. It's one of the major roadblocks, actually, <laughs> to, to, uh, uh, to new future experiments. Uh, and and I, that could be exciting if that happens. Uh, but you you can see that if you don't have that, then you can't really eavesdrop the way you might want to, right? Okay, so um, let's move on to past now. <laughs> so um, less than 50 years ago, scientists believed that single molecule detection is impossible. So in the next 50 years, will there be another breakthrough as big as this? Can you imagine something mm -hmm. exciting to dig in? I guess the, to, to match that um, jump, the, you, you must cite something that we believe is impossible, even in the next 50 years. That's true, too. <laughs> so maybe, uh, uh, W, you can tell us what you think will be impossible. Uh -huh. <laughs> You know, uh, I, I, it, it's great for you to <laughs> pass the baton to me so gracefully. Uh, it is, <laughs> it's very, very hard to predict the future. Okay, and uh, I, uh, I certainly believe that there will be another breakthrough. Surely, uh, there's there's so much creativity and and all of the minds that are around in the world and and the young people uh, and so on that uh, it, it's always turning over the next stone thinking of what's the next thing that you can do and and so forth that there that that will lead to breakthroughs the the only uh, problem is um the uh the students have to be taught to to be prepared for surprises because that breakthrough will be from a surprise something not expected as 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 talk jay just said uh, and and rather than throwing it away or saying, oh, well, I wasn't supposed to get this result or anything like that, <laughs> um, uh, recognizing that it's different uh, could be a clue to something that, that would be uh, very exciting and new. What I can think about is, you know, if we can detect molecules without fluorescence label or antibodies, right? I think these two things are, we always talk about it. How many can you detect, right? And we're always limited by the number of dyes or number of spectral separations, or, or for the fixed imaging, uh, what antibodies, right? Monoclonal. So if you can label, label free, I guess, label free imaging that can detect down to diffusing motions of the molecules. Um, I think, uh, yeah. Well, that's right. That's right. I mean, label, there is label free imaging now going on in, in certain regimes but it, it's not quite down to individual molecules uh, because the signal is so weak so someone has to invent a way to make the signal larger uh, and and that's the kind of thing that we we think is <laughs> moderately impossible uh, but I wouldn't say completely impossible yeah so the labeling free method um would still like to have uh, like chemical specificity so that uh, we, don't, we don't just look at just blobs as in standard electron microscopy images as uh, W mentioned in mm -hmm. his talk. Um, so uh, I guess uh, contrast mechanisms such as Raman could give you uh, chemical specificity and it may give, even give you maybe uh, 
dozens of different so-called colors, but you know, whether you, ca you can actually extend it to the single molecule sensitivity um, is a big, uh, big if. Right, mm -hmm. so I, I I agree with uh, W in the in, in the sense that there is probably, you know, uh, moderately uh, uh, impossible. You know, I can probably <laughs> bet that it's not it, it cannot be done in the next fifty years, and not having not have to worry about getting embarrassed at least you know <laughs> before I I die. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's fascinating that uh, when you think, for example, of vibrational contrast. Uh, the schemes that are being done today with uh, cars or uh, infrared microscopy for vibrational modes and so on, uh, like Tagjeeb says, can provide a number of many more labels, many more colors, so to speak. But uh, very quickly, this question of specificity comes up, and, and you find that often the people that get the biggest signals and the best results have been using a very special vibrational mode like uh, cyanide or something like that, CN, that's different from many other uh, vibrations that are around. So it gives you a really good sensitivity. Uh, it's almost as if to do that well, you need to label again. You need to develop a whole set uh, of uh, vibrational labels that you can attach. And so, so there's people working on that too. So uh, I, I think there's lots of... Uh, uh, opportunity for for more progress. Yeah, that Carolyn Bertozzi's um, azide chemistry, right? That was used beautifully in your glycan imaging. So if that can be diversified into many different categories, that would be small enough, chemically specific enough to tag, um, you know, very small. Yeah, invasiveness is there. So. Right. I mean, unnatural amino acids is one area that we, we've all heard about, and but we don't use that much. It, it has apparently great power because you have the, the opportunity to put some specific chemical moiety at a particular location in a protein that by itself is pretty small. That's great, but we're, we're not using it as much as, you, as, you, as we might have hoped. Yeah, it was actually great to personally great to hear about these stories because I'm working on label free end up being label again but <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> my personal research is also related to so I'm very glad to hear that um, let's move on to the next question uh, is uh, scientific innovation brings both uh, opportunities and risk um, so now uh, today we heard a bit about how the single molecule imaging uh, led into the genome engineering. Um, so now let's think about the whether or not we can actually control the human genomes freely, analyze and manipulate it in the future. Can you envision such a thing happening in your future? Genome and I mean, we have Illumina and Pacific Biosciences, Nanopore. These are single molecule techniques that mm -hmm. have single base resolution. So it's already used for analy analysis of human genome. Mm -hmm. So that's quite exciting. Um, uh, and but I guess I guess it has its own limitations. But so I, I want to talk touch upon the topic of ethics question. How mm -hmm. the genomic information, if we go to the level of figuring out everyone's genome to single mm -hmm. base resolution what kind of problems are we go going to get into? Um, yeah, the over analysis, right? So if you know someone, basically people are barcoded, right? Mm -hmm. You can look up, you know, disease propensities, you know, maybe per person's characters or, you know, um, or personalized medicines, you know, all these information can be given, then I think we're gonna have all, all kinds of problems of people getting disadvantaged opportunities for jobs and for uh, different positions, for example. So um, while the, these are all cool technologies, I think it will come at the cost of um, revealing mm -hmm. too much information into public and people getting barcoded into their genomic uh, scale information. So yeah, it's kind of worrisome at the same time. Yeah. Well, um, I, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Remember what happened uh, back uh, when uh, Paul Berg and all of these other people got together uh, w when, when they realized that uh, they can insert a gene uh, into an organism and have uh, combinant DNA. And there was great fear 
uh, uh, just like this. But but the scientists got together and said, we're going to not do this. We're, we're going to not immediately use it to make superhumans. Okay. And, and so, great. Uh, sometimes in history, uh, people do the right thing. Uh, and we have to hope that that will also happen in this case, that there will be rules that say you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Uh, you can cure certain diseases. You want to relieve suffering, just like uh, medicine uh, has a goal uh, to to relieve suffering. Um, if you uh, but want to make superhumans or something like that, then that that's quite a big uh, ethical leap, and a, a lot of people beyond science have to be thinking about this. Yeah. Uh, also, I want to come back to the original question. It's not just analyzing the human genome um, uh, that single molecule technologies have really um, enabled. Uh, but also, uh, when you do genome editing, there's only one or two copies of the gene in, the, in a single cell. So it is actually single molecule manipulation technology. And I think, uh, based on the current pace of progress, probably in a few years, we'll be at a point where we don't have to worry about the off-target effect. We'll be able to create editing outcome that we write down in a computer code uh, without any uh, uh, off-target effects. I think that future is uh, within uh, a reach relatively quickly. But really, the next question that is really a much more challenging is actually how to actually predict what will happen to your cell and your body when you make that prescribed uh, genomic change. That becomes a systems biology problem, and we need a lot more knowledge and understanding of the system level properties before we, we are able to make a prediction. You know, for example, if you want to create a, a super athlete that can dunk you know, without even jumping, uh, let, uh, but uh, you may be able to make a precise change to a gene that it is you know, possible. I mean, that can make it possible, but then you don't know actually what else will happen to the cell and, and, and the body, mm -hmm. right? So that uh, that becomes a uh, 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 big uh, still remaining technical hurdle. Now, in terms of ethical question, let's say you overcome the systems biology question. You know exactly what will happen when you make that change. You can make that change at the ge uh, genome uh, scale then uh, that technology is going to be very expensive. So who is going to have access to the technology? Only those people who can afford to pay the price for doing this? Only the people living in uh, the westernized countries? Or what about the people who uh, uh, actually uh, live in the global uh, uh, south? And accessibility of the technology uh, is another important uh, ethical issue. Yes, I, I I certainly agree that you uh, point out that uh, off-target effects uh, need to be uh, very carefully analyzed. Um, it, I think it's fantastic right now that uh, there is a new technology called uh, chimeric antigen T cell receptors, CAR T, that is uh, able to uh, allow someone to uh, provide their T cells, uh, and then they can be uh, manipulated in the laboratory uh, to change a specific gene so that those T cells will hone in on mutant uh, cells that are part of uh, blood cancers. And uh, uh, providing those back to the person is, is turning out to be incredibly uh, powerful at eradicating certain diseases. So, you know, one gene and, and, it's, and it makes a change is one thing, but when the gene is in the middle of a huge regulatory network that has many, many connections, it's gonna be far more difficult, far, far more difficult to control off-target effects. And that is also, uh, you know, I guess a topic for discussion for additional ethical issue. If you want to make these technologies safer, you need to have a lot more fundamental science data on certain types of cells and, you know, individuals, but most of the data are still produced for people in uh, wealthy countries. And, uh, and the knowledge that you generate uh, may apply, again, uh, 
to sort of the systems biology question as to what happens when you make the genomic changes using CRISPR, for example. But uh, that may not apply to uh, uh, those who are coming from uh, different parts of the world where the you know, uh, genomic sequences are much more diverse. All right, so let's move on to somewhat little more easier for you to <laughs> answer kind of a question. Um, so many of us here uh, are non-biologists, except for Dr. Um, uh, or physicists or chemists or uh, engineers, uh, to touch upon the, the, the topic of biology. Uh, when you first did it, uh, what was the one thing that bothered you most about biology? Uh, that was so different from your original field of study. But however, what about biology attracted you the most? <laughs> so, uh, I don't mean to go first uh, uh, all the time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Tajib can go first. This okay, time. so I, I go first. I go first. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so I think about 20 years ago, uh, I went to my first biological, uh, biology conference. It was a small meeting, about 150 people. And I realized that in, in the biology conference, people fight a lot more often than uh, in, <laughs> in a physics conference, in large part because I, th I feel that they don't agree on you know, what is the best you know, system to study because biology is very diverse. You have you know, human cells, you have uh, mouse cells, you have you know, you know, the Drosophila fruit fly cells, you have E. coli cells, and people study maybe the same process but in different organisms. And sometimes I think a difference <laughs> uh, in the result comes from the fact that they're not studying the exact same system. And uh, I, feel, I felt that they were fighting with each other because, mainly because they are not looking at the exact same, you know, uh, systems and problems, where the system is a lot more uniformly agreed upon what to study in physics, for example. That was what I felt uh, at the very beginning. Yes. So, yeah, I don't know that we can ask you this because you already are a biologist, but... So, maybe I should try <laughs> to answer this, um, if you don't mind. Well, um, what struck me uh, when it's getting involved early on in, in um, biological projects was the following. There's a great many things that have been learned from decades and decades of biochemistry. But if you look closely at the earlier work, uh, you see that almost everything is a gel. Almost everything is uh, a plus and minus. Uh, try this and take it off. And maybe you can think of it more like a, a two by two correlation matrix, plus, minus, plus, minus. Okay. And uh, th so this is before the, the, the time of more and more quantitative uh, techniques uh, have, have infiltrated uh, in, into biochemistry. And, and when I was thinking about that, it, it's, I think it's just, amazing amazing that so much can be learned and concluded from these two by two correlation matrices used again and again and again and again many many times okay so as, as a quantitative a phys, you know physical person this was amazing to me because you know just like Tajib said in physics we we make measurements of voltages or whatever and we write them down and we argue about how many digits but everything's quantitative in a different sort of way so that, that's what really struck me at the beginning and and finally after years I finally realized why it worked how could this work you know to to learn so much it's because every experiment you work as hard as possible to design it so that those pluses and minuses have a big impact. Uh, if you have a control or, and a not a control and so forth, if controls, et cetera, are well designed, then those tests just by, you know, on and off um, can, can lead you forward, okay? To, and then to make the next step, the next step, the next step, the next step. So I, I just was uh, amazed uh, that, had, that so much had been learned in this way. Maybe you can share since you're, <laughs> I'm a biologist. So I <laughs> well, I was going to actually ask the opposite question as a <laughs> yeah. biologist as training. How do you <laughs> envision these non-biologists touching the topic? <laughs> um, 
So yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes, <laughs> <laughs> kind of empathize with them. Um, for me, coming the other way around, um, biology has been always intricate and complicated and therefore interesting to me, except for immunology. I think I had <laughs> problems with too many IL-1, IL-2, IL-3, uh, so I couldn't really study it. But um, yeah, so, but then when I entered into biophysics, um, it was so satisfying to be able to put numbers on, you know, not like number of molecules, the concentrations. <laughs> and so the quantification, I think, uh, is something that I started learning and appreciating and formulas that we can fit to uh, deduce uh, parameters that otherwise we cannot, hidden information mm -hmm. in the data. So, um, so yeah, I'm still, I think biology is at heart, but I, I love using physical tools whenever possible to get more, um, information out of the system I study. So I appreciate both fields. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, let me wrap up with the last question. Um, so I'm sure you interact with young generation every day, and especially after the pandemic uh, with these young people educating in very different ways, uh, we'll envision that the young generation may see the science and technology very differently. Um, so from um, ex your experience, what would be the biggest difference between your generation, the young ones, in approaching research? Maybe I, uh, I, 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 I go first, <laughs> if, that's, if that's okay. Uh, actually, I, I feel like I'm still young. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, 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 one uh, big difference between my generation and, I guess, younger generation that is uh, uh, you know, st still studying, you know, in schools and, you know, college and grad school and so on, is that I guess back then we had uh, a lot fewer distractions <laughs> with the social media and all these electronic devices. You're always attached to a screen and, um, uh, you know, you, ne you're you, you never get bored, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you do a lot of multitasking and, and, that's, that's also what I do these days. <laughs> uh, but at least I didn't spend my formative, uh, formative years, right? Mm -hmm. you know, young students uh, with uh, so many different uh, ways to distract uh, myself. So I, I would say that is uh, one uh, big difference mm -hmm. that is probably uh, uh, you know, something that is not uh, ideal you know, for, for the younger generations. I agree with I agree with that uh, very much. Um, and the uh, the biggest difference really is um, we used to go to a big index, look up all papers that are relative related to a particular topic, and go read those papers by by finding them in books in the library and uh, get, get you know selecting uh, literature and looking at the past seeing what has been done before, seeing what has been done 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years ago. And, and I, what I find these days is uh, students will, will not do that. Uh, they don't know what is usually, there's, there's many situations where people are not aware of what's been done uh, 25, 30 years ago. Um, you know, single molecules were first measured 34 years ago. So all of the early work <laughs> Many people don't know about anymore uh, that that is starting in this field, and um, the the other thing that's different that I see a lot is not as many people uh, know about electronics. Uh, they they don't uh, do simple electrical experiments. I I find people that don't know what uh, about the circuit breakers that are available uh, in. Uh, your home, or they may have been fuses, okay, or or circuit breakers, but uh, people are unaware of of some of these things, and it's it's a general issue throughout all of our society. Everyone is carrying around a supercomputer in their hands. They don't recognize that it's filled with transistors, electrical circuits, wires. You know, decisions are made. Is it warm? Is it hot? How is it connecting to, to networks and all that sort of stuff? There, there's there's a, um, a whole layer of complexity in our society that, that people don't really appreciate. 
Uh, but it's not that different from complexity in humans and the brain and, you know, neural systems and, you know, biochemistry and so forth. But nevertheless, um, I, 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 um, I think people should always be asking themselves what is involved in this object and how does it work? How does it work? How does it really work? <laughs> um beyond just clicking and whatever looking at pictures and so on so i think the distractions are bad in terms and because they they sort of keep you away from learning this kind of detail the detail is needed to do fundamental science oh sorry to be on a soapbox <laughs> i think i want to add to the discussion that i think we live in this generation i think myself inclu including um i think we are very good at finding instant answers. Like we mm. don't have to wait a long time, struggle or decipher, you know, spend a long time to search for things. It's answers right there, like Google. <laughs> uh, so I think the same mentality applies, right? Experiments not working, then just give up, right? You don't like fight to find a solution to, you know, do it this way and that way, try to troubleshoot. So I think mm -hmm. troubleshooting effort is really, uh, minimized and mm -hmm. rather you are looking for that quick smart instant mm -hmm. solution to your problem so i think um, that is something that i think we used to have more i think it was uh, virtue almost right finding your way to figure out a solution um, but now i think that's kind of mentality has disappeared so it's mm -hmm. kind of sad to see <laughs> that going away from science yeah so in line of that, actually, in Korea, the number of young scientists are diminishing mm -hmm. slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you have any uh, advice or any inspiring talk about the young generation, how exciting and great to be a scientist? I sometimes tell my students that I do my hobby and then I get salary out of it. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we get paid for having fun. They get paid for for learn for learning how the world works, and uh, so th that that's very very rewarding. Of course, young people are can also be a great source of new ideas and uh, looking at something from a different point of view and asking a question differently, uh, which can lead to new insight. And and that's that's really one of the really rewarding parts about it. Um, uh, I uh, also ag agree with with uh, what everyone has said. But I, but I think that to, to inspire young people, it's, it's just important to recognize that science is important. Science is essential. Science is the only way we're going to solve the problems of the world. If, if, we're, if you're going to build a bridge, you have to use science. If you're going to cure a disease, you have to use science. So you have to learn th these things that require some dedicated effort and and thinking and and accomplishment um and uh otherwise uh, you cannot answer this question that uh, you asked asked us one of the things that we were asked to do is to pose a question to the public uh that's an ethical question about all this how are we going to force uh, how can we be sure that scientific truth wins over what some people are calling free speech. You know, if we don't solve this problem, we have a very, very serious situation. Uh, what I mean is there are people that say, oh, I, I'm allowed to do free speech, so I'll just say wrong things. I'll just say things that are just not true at all. Yet, yet if, we, if we're going to, as I say, solve all these problems and so forth, we need scientific truth to be recognized. So how can we make sure that the, 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 this is recognized, that we don't degenerate into some situation where it's it's non-truths? And so uh, this is a big problem. And I, I think we should challenge young people to help with this problem. Um, yeah, uh, I think that that's a really uh, uh, excellent point. I, I, I think the importance of basic sciences is you know, it cannot be overemphasized. If you uh, if you actually just aim to cure cancer, and you try just random things uh, uh, until things work, uh, you know you're not going to make really a lot of progress. And 
I think very uh, patient efforts to advance our knowledge in different fields, uh, you know, occasionally uh, run into something that is uh, really groundbreaking. And you cannot really predict what's going to happen. Um, I think for, for inspiring young, uh, young students, uh, I think it is also important not only to emphasize uh, discovery of knowledge, uh, but also how one can use the knowledge to improve the human conditions. And I really enjoyed uh, going to physics uh, seminars when I was a physics professor to learn about cosmology and you know, astrophysics. And uh, I felt sometimes uh, t uh, very small. You know, in whatever you learn in cosmology seminar is something universal. It's true here on this planet, but also true you know, at the other uh, end of the universe. What we learn in biology is not going to be universal. Right? If there's another life form in a distant planet, it may not even be based on carbon, but uh, it is important to us because it is about us, right? So the generate, to generate knowledge that can potentially to improve the human conditions for us and for others on this planet, I don't think there's anything more rewarding than that. I think that would be you know, my, my pitch to the students. And I would like to add to that, that that's really great. I would like to add to that it is fun. It, science can really be enjoyable. When, when you're uh, doing an experiment and then it, it does something that surprises you, that can be just very thrilling. And the example that I want to mention is when we were looking at these single molecules at low temperatures, it's in a frozen solid. Um, the molecule has a specific frequency or wavelength where it's, where it's absorbing and emitting light. Fine. And the big surprise was one day we saw them jumping back and forth from one color to another by themselves. I mean, it was the greatest thing around. It was fantastic. It was we were jumping up and down. The molecules were jumping around, and and <laughs> and you know, it's it's uh, it's really exciting. So um, I, I I try to encourage students to get that thrill every day. Get get a thrill out of whatever uh, science you're doing that day. Uh, you, you don't have to wait for the, the great breakthrough or the Nobel Prize or whatever. There, there's, there's great uh, value and, and excitement all the time. Yeah, I, I agree absolutely with that uh, se sentiment. And sometimes I tell my students that they're really lucky to be born now, because if they had been born 200 years ago, <laughs> right, and only the people who are very wealthy Right? could actually do any kind of science. Mm -hmm. Very small number of people on the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, you know, almost anyone you know, can do science. Now, if you go f to the future, let's say 100 years from now, maybe uh, you know, humans may not be doing science. Maybe you know, all of the important societal questions and technology problems may be uh, done by the computers, you know, maybe uh, uh, journals will publish only a small subset of the discoveries that can be comprehended by human mind, but not the major big things, right? So you may also be living in a small window of you know, human history where normal human beings can actually make major discoveries mm -hmm. and derive uh, joy mm -hmm. from that, right? Uh, so, so enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so now let me uh, conclude today's session of the Che Scientific Innovation Series. Thank you for our prominent speakers for the inspiring talks and lively discussion. Um, to our viewers on YouTube, thank you very much. Thank you.